What if the you that you thought was you really wasn't you? What if you had a deeper history buried beneath ages of time waiting to be revealed? Are you ready and are you brave enough to uncover the truth of who you really are? Come with me as we journey to the famed location of King Arthur's Round Table in Carleon Wells and learn a valuable kingdom lesson about what it means to be truly born again and who you really are as a child of God. It's time to get out of the boat and walk upon the waves. Welcome to the journey. Welcome to Kyrleon Wales, a site that's been intimately linked to the legendary King Arthur and his famous Knights of the Round Table for almost 1,000 years. We're deep in the heart of Wales, and the stories of King Arthur flow hard and fast here, intertwined in the forests, the buildings, the waters, and the hills. 800 years ago, this site was a large circular mound with a deep hollow, covered by rolling lush green grass. The 12th century historian Geoffrey Monmouth in his history of the kings of Britain, believed this site to be where Arthur was named King of Britain, and that this place was believed to be the home of King Arthur's fabled Round Table of Camelot. The idea that Caerleon was the site of King Arthur's Camelot was so widespread that 300 years later, an invading French army came to visit the site in order to pay homage to the legendary king. And for 800 years, the Arthurian history of this locale was believed to be absolutely true and there were few doubts about its authenticity. Over the preceding centuries, locals occasionally dug at the site, using the stone found within the mound and buildings within the village. And in 1909, the stone features of the buildings attracted the attention of the Liverpool Committee for Excavation and Research in Wells in the Marches. Finding a number of intriguing discoveries during its first official excavation, the committee enlisted the help of the Daily Mail to raise money for a larger excavation that would encompass not just the circular mound, but the surrounding area. The excavation revealed that Caerleon was actually the remains of a large Roman fortress, and the circular mound was a large amphitheater constructed between 74 and 90 CE, and it hosted animal hunts, gladiator battles, and military parades for the invading Romans. In fact, it's the best preserved example of such an amphitheater in all of Britain. At Caerleon's height of power, the interior wall of the amphitheater was believed to be over four meters tall, and the exterior wall 10 meters high, with the amphitheater's wooden benches providing seating for up to 6,000 spectators, who gathered to watch bloodthirsty displays featuring gladiatorial combat and exotic wild animals. Over 30,000 Roman soldiers lived, breathed, ate, and trained at Caerleon at a time using the fortress as a launching point for Roman invasions throughout South Wales over 2,000 years ago. And while the original fort is believed to have been built after Caesar's first invasion of Britain in 55 BC, within 100 years the fortress of Caerleon was one of three major such strongholds in Britain. But the Romans weren't the first to establish some kind of kingdom here. The Romans were forced to build fortifications here because of a Celtic people known as the Siliures, who fiercely matched the might of Rome's invasion forces. And 500 years before that, a large hill fort was constructed nearby, which some historians and present-day neo-pagans claim was the stronghold of Belimar, Celtic king of the Druids and early king of Britain. With such a rich legacy that had such a powerful role in the history of not just Britain, but of the Empire of Rome, you'd think that the Latin record of Rome's conquests would have had identified Caerleon long ago and local people would have known what this place was. But you'd be wrong. Hardly any of this site's history was widely known until less than 100 years ago. 
This place was so mysterious and otherworldly to the people of the Middle Ages that in the 12th century, the historian Geoffrey Monmouth fancifully attributed the site to the legendary King Arthur, as there was nothing else in the region that was quite like it. For almost 1,500 years, the truth of this site was hidden, with false histories and labels attached to it, until that false history became this place's reality. Until a hundred years ago, when those that knew what to look for called out the gold that was waiting underneath and worked to bring it to the surface so its truth could bless the world today. There's a massive kingdom lesson to be found here. There's a you that you think you know, but the truth is, there's a you that was created before time began, the you that you really are. And since you've been born, the world has sought to qualify you, quantify you, categorize you, and define you. You've been given labels, types, and names. Other people, not knowing the real you, have come along and placed their version of you upon you. You've even adopted many of these worldly ideas as your identity, and you've come to accept those identities as who you are. You've created molds and masks around these ideas and adopted yourself to them, taking on the appearance of these identities and accepting them as your own. But see, the real you, you are so much more. You're more than a label or your job or your position. When you allow the world to define you, when you accept those identities as your own and define yourself by them, then you're subject to the whims of the world you are susceptible to the weight of your false identity. Just like Kyrleon, you are misidentified in your history. Well, it's wrong. And sure, that false history may seem great and may even lean into who you really are a little bit, but at its heart, it's a lie. And when you're defined by the world, well, the world will overwhelm you, outweigh you, and when you don't suit its purposes, will crush you. And when it's done with you, overgrow you. Just like what happened at Kyrleon. But what if? What if the world didn't define you? What if you were actually defined by a higher power? What if there was a father who called you to be more, who called you to live your truest identity in whom he created you to be, who created you to be loved by him and to walk with him and talk with him and who called you to creatively and positively transform this world by demonstrating Him, to define the world with His glory instead of the other way around, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And what if there is a son whose sole purpose when he walked upon this earth was to reveal the love of that father to children who had lost their way and who had let the crushing weight of the world define them and their own view of the father? What if there was a son who revealed a way back to the heart of that loving father, opening the heavens, rending the veil, revealing to a broken world the truth about a father's love and devotion? You see, what you think is you is really not. The true you can only be defined by the one who created you, your creator. The true you is loved and cherished no matter what you think you've done or how low you think you've gone. To a loving father, the son or a daughter is always a son or a daughter, no matter what. The true you is not, could not, be a lowly worm and unworthy wretch or any of that other misidentified garbage. Because if the worth of something is established by the price that is paid for it, then heaven paid the ultimate price to restore your true identity to you. You were created with purpose, with passion, with love. And while the pain of this world has done all it could to take that away, the Father offers you another way, the way of peace, the way of shalom, the way of acceptance and nurturing and love. But how do you step into that realization? How do you leave behind what the world says is you? 
How do you dig back through the overgrowth and the false belief and the implied identities that the world has shouldered upon you? Well, in the words of a being more wise than I, you have to be born again. You see, this is one of the great mysteries about something we have turned into a catchphrase in the Christian world, the idea of being born again. It's the great mystery behind what Jesus said to Nicodemus. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. John 3, verses 3 to 8. So let's unpack. First, what have we done with what Jesus has said here? Well, as humans doing what humans do, we turned it into a ritual, something we just do. Okay, you say you're a Christian, let's dunk you in water, and after that, you're now part of our tribe, and you're born again. What do I mean by that? All too often, we look at being born again as an add-on to our old self. And by just reducing it to a baptism ritual, we completely miss out. Yes, there's need for water baptism. After all, one of my most powerful moments with God came after my own baptism. So I personally know how powerful of a moment it is. But the baptism is symbolic of something we miss and ignore, being truly born again. Jesus is saying that we must be born again, born into who God created us to be, stepping into the reality of who we are in His Spirit. We don't base our identity in what the world says about us. Instead, as a child of God, who He created us to be must always come first, and we move from there. And that is anything but an add-on. After truly being born again, you cannot just go back to how you used to be. Let's just take the example of this beautiful archeological site. Once it was revealed to be an ancient Roman fortress and amphitheater responsible for housing 30,000 Roman troops at a time. Could this place realistically be called the site of King Arthur's Round Table? No. Instead, it's known as a place that people once thought as the site of King Arthur's Table. But now the archeological remnants on site are known by their true identity. Its true worth and glory has now been revealed and can't be covered any longer. The overgrowth has been pulled away. The gold has been identified and revealed. To reveal the kingdom of God, to walk in it, to see it, you must be born again. You have to step into the reality of who God says you are. You have to excavate away the junk that you thought was you and realize who you really are. An empowered son or daughter who's loved and commissioned to reveal his glory to a world that desperately needs it. When you know his spirit, When the real you is revealed, there's something that you know. You are royalty, and royalty has a responsibility to reign righteously, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. That's Micah 6.8. Being born again into the kingdom of God is realizing that He's not an add-on to the old way you did life. He is the source. He is the cornerstone of what you build upon. Being born again into the kingdom of God is knowing that you cannot go back to who you used to be, and why would you want to? It doesn't matter if you live in a caravan trailer down by the river or you live in a penthouse. When you know who you are in Him, you're royalty, and you'll begin to know the kingdom and reveal Him wherever you go. You can't help it. That's what children do. They bear the image of their parents. You do the work of the kingdom because it's who you are. It's not something that you're striving to be. What is born of the flesh is of the world. It's the world that's the add-on, not the other way around. 
We can only step into who we really are through His Spirit, which is the true source of who you really are. And when that Spirit blows, you might just find yourself like me, halfway across the world on a windswept archaeological site, sharing the glory of the Lord. Or you may be in your hometown, radically shifting the atmospheres of your workplace just by being who you truly are, a child of God. God's heart is to reveal your true identity in Christ so you can release His love and to become like Him, moving from glory to glory. He desires to overwhelm your world with the reality of how He sees you and to revolutionize the way you see and even think about yourself and about Him. He's no longer distant or far away. He's right here in you, and you are with Him. You're never alone. You're never in need. You're filled to overflowing, and His grace and mercy radically pursues you all the days of your life, even when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. When you embrace your true identity, you begin to step into the realization of who you are in Christ, and you change the reality of your earthly world. Your God-given nature begins to transform your earthly nature, and you become a light on a hill. And all you have to do is ask, Papa, you're a good, good father. Show me who I really am in your eyes. And don't let go until he shows you. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it'll be given to you. It's the only free gift that's going to cost you everything. But it's so worth it because you were made for such a time as this. Get ready for the journey because your life will never be the same. Angry, vengeful, mad, silent, disappointed, mysterious, wrathful, absent, and just a little bit judgy. Ask an average person what they believe the Christian God to be like, and chances are one of these answers will pop up. But what if I told you that God was none of those things? What if I told you that the truth of who God is has been stolen from you, and the image you've been left with is a lie, forged in an attempt to separate you from not just knowing who you are, but whose you are. Journey with me to mysterious Margam Abbey in Port Talbot, Wales, and uncover the essential kingdom lesson about the truth of our Heavenly Father, and discover His heart for you and the amazing world which He loves. Margam Park is one of my favorite places in the world. There is so much beauty, history, and variety here, it'll truly make your head spin. Whether it's the woodlands, the trails, the castle, the abbey, the orangery, the farm, the lakes and ponds, or the infinite amounts of legends about the place, Margam Park is truly an intersection of where the past and the present meet, with secrets waiting to be explored and revealed. For over 4,000 years, this place has been considered sacred ground, essential to the spiritual health of the region. It's been fought over, defended, invaded, and claimed by the Celts, the Romans, the Saxons, the Irish, the Vikings, and the English. During the Bronze and Iron Ages, indigenous tribes warred for dominance over this area. Two Iron Age forts still overlook this place today. These hills were sacred to a people called the Silures, dark-skinned and curly-haired Celts and legend says that their sacred burial sites are still here, buried beneath the rocks and trees. After the armies of Rome abandoned Britain in 400 CE, the Celtic people here carried on the Christian practices the Romans brought with them. But isolated from Rome, these practices would evolve into what we now call Celtic Christianity. And since this area was considered holy land by the Celts, a simple Celtic Christian monastery was erected here, made of simple wood buildings. But everything would change in Wales in 1091, 
with the vicious invasion of the English Marcher Lords. The invasion of the Marcher Lords began a long bloody chapter in the history of Britain. Desiring new territory and resources, the King of England set his sights west, towards a country that we call Wales. English Marcher Lords were powerful men and were a law unto themselves, and few, if any Marcher Lords, were as feared as Robert Fitzhamon. Fitzhamon cut a bloody path throughout South Wales in 1091, seizing territory and murdering every Welsh prince who stood in his way. He was merciless, even going so far as to demand one mile of gold coins from one prince as a tribute, which he actually received. When Robert Fitzhamon died in 1107, all of his Welsh holdings passed to his daughter Mabel. And in many ways, Mabel was the son Fitzhamon never had, just as politically conniving and ambitious as her father, ever was. Mabel married Robert, 1st Earl of Gloucester, the son of King Henry of England. This strategic marriage consolidated the Welsh lands that Fitzhamon took by force with that of royal English blood, creating a blood claim to Welsh land, making Mabel and Robert the region's power couple, a power they were not afraid to use. Through brutal campaigns similar to the one used by Fitzhamon, Robert and Mabel continued to acquire Welsh territory, lands, and wealth until something happened in 1147 CE that would change the history of this region forever. After a bout with serious illness, Robert granted this portion of land, over 18,000 acres, to an abbot named William Clairvaux in order to build an abbey and a monastery dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary, right smack dab on these lands that had been purchased with the blood of the Welsh. And two months later, Robert was dead. Now make a little note of this fact, because we're going to come back to it later. But first, we have some more ground to cover. With the granting of 18,000 acres to the extremely wealthy Cistercian monks of Clairvaux, Wells' spiritual history would be forever changed. Wells was going to leave the simplicity of Celtic Christianity behind, and instead get a taste of the big-time Christianity that was more in vogue upon the European continent. First, the simple Celtic monastery that was here was forced off the land, its wooden wattle buildings were destroyed, and its monks cast out. Second, the foundations were laid for a building project the size of which had never been seen in Wales before. For 40 years, skilled craftsmen worked around the clock, shaping stone to build an abbey, church, cloister, and offices befitting an esteemed daughter house of St. Bernard's Cistercian House of Clairvaux, Normandy. The Cistercian monks were a skilled and unpaid labor force. At its height, the monks of Margam Abbey actively farmed over 7,000 acres of land and were experts in animal husbandry, rearing sheep, cows, and horses. By the end of the 12th century, Margam Abbey was the most powerful monastery in Western Britain. The abbey and its monks central to the social, cultural, and religious life of South Wales. Monks and scribes diligently copied and stored manuscripts, legal and religious documents, and histories of not just Wales, but all of Britain here at the Abbey and its famous chapter house, including the Welsh copy of the Doomsday Book, a record of every item that could be taxed, papers of nobility, and land holdings throughout Wales. For 300 years, through ups and downs caused by rebellions, the Black Death, insane English taxation, flooding, and livestock diseases, this religious site would maintain its status as one of Britain's greatest repositories of knowledge. Some serious history went down here. But all would not remain wonderful for wealthy Margam Abbey. Soon, it became a target. In 1534, a massive spiritual shift struck the British Isles. When the Catholic Church did not approve of King Henry VIII's divorce from Catherine of Aragon, Henry split with the Church of Rome and established the Church of England, naming himself as the head of the Anglican Church. And this was bad news if you were associated with Catholicism. In 1537, Henry VIII forced the Dissolution of the Monasteries Act, which disbanded all Catholic monasteries and churches throughout the British Isle. And this allowed the king to seize all incomes, buildings, and assets of any organization aligned with Catholicism. Anything of wealth in the abbeys and cloisters were seized, leaving little behind other than dust and broken stones. Whatever wealth Margam Abbey had was liquidated to fill the coffers of the English king. The monks and clergy were given a less than royal send-off, 
and Margam Abbey was unceremoniously shut down. As part of the seizure, the Abbey's original charter, documents, books of worth, everything, including the copy of the Doomsday Book that belonged to Wales, were taken to London. And the Welsh Doomsday Book even remains there today, under lock and key in the British Library. During the mid-1700s, Margam passed to the Talbot family through marriage. And it was during the late 1700s and the early 1800s that most of the current buildings were constructed, including the architectural masterpieces of the Orangery, the gardens, the relocation of the facade of the Temple of the Four Seasons, the gardener's cottage, and of course, the Tudor Gothic wonder that is known as Margam Castle. Walking the grounds of Margam is a stroll through history. It's truly a sight to behold. Legends of stolen holy lands, strange religious rituals, ghostly monks, murders, suicides, curses, undiscovered graveyards, literally this place has it all. You could film romances here, or horror movies. The story of Morgan Park literally transcends thousands of years and is beyond rich in history and majesty. Morgan Park is one of my favorite places to explore. The layers of history here are beautiful, and no matter how many layers you peel back, you're always discovering something new. What I most love about Margam is its underlying spiritual legacy. It's a place that's been honored as sacred for thousands of years and has passed between many different cultures and people. And Margam's behind the scenes history reveals something important, particularly regarding the messed up ways we think about God and how we relate to him. If you recall, the land for the abbey that was built here was granted by Mabel Fitzhammond's husband, Robert, first Earl of Gloucester, to the Abbot of Clairvaux to build the grandest monastery Western Britain had ever seen. Now, did you think to ask why in the world would a marcher lord, responsible for the brutal subjugation of the Welsh people, grant 18,000 acres of primo land to a monastery upon his deathbed? Point blank, medieval man was terrified of God's wrath, and the wealthy would do whatever they could to absolve themselves of their sins and save themselves from eternal hellfire and damnation. During the Middle Ages, it was a common practice for lords and landowners to give large portions of their land to the Roman Catholic Church. It was believed that in doing so, they could ensure salvation not just for themselves, but in some cases, their descendants. And the church would, in turn, guarantee salvation through a contract called a charter, which in exchange for lands, livestock, and gifts, would fireproof the souls of the soon-to-be deceased. So feudal lords, feeling a bit responsible for the atrocities and spilled blood that occurred during their time on earth, especially during campaigns as brutal as those of the marcher lords in Wales, gave large swaths of their lands to the church as a get out of hell free card. And this wasn't rare. This was a common practice throughout medieval Europe of lords, ladies, and property holders. And it wasn't considered strange at all. And let's face it, when you know your time is coming, wouldn't you do whatever you could to avoid eternal damnation? So if you can secure salvation by donating lands or performing works, why wouldn't you try? After all, most of us, whether you know it or not, still operate under this messed up system. But here's the thing, you can't buy salvation, and you can't buy off God's anger with land, donations, or property. And sure, we think we understand that, but how often do we try to buy off God's anger with our good works? How often do you do the right thing to try to gain God's favor? How often do we act a certain way because of what we get, say a blessing like salvation, instead of being a certain way because of who and whose we are? See, now you're getting it. You see, when we try to buy God off, it reveals our poor fundamental misunderstanding of who God is. The truth of who your father is has been stolen from you. Because you see, God isn't angry, and you don't have to bribe him. And this is a massive kingdom lesson. God is in love with you. 
He created you to spend eternity with you, to enjoy you as a good father does his children, and He fully intends to see this come to pass. You can't buy what is a free gift, God's love, His healing, His salvation, and His deliverance. It's a gift from a father who loves his children, a father who is love himself, according to 1 John 4, 8. And according to 2 Peter 3, 9, it's the father's desire that none of his children perish. God desires relationship with us. And the reason we have such a poor understanding of ourselves as his children is because the world has a poor understanding of God. And that's 1 John 3, 1, by the way. In order to understand who we are, we have to understand whose we are. We have to see God for who He really is. So much of our artwork, images, and beliefs about God are just plain wrong. God's not a terrifying Zeus-like figure in the clouds who has this gigantic list of things we've done wrong, just chomping at the bit to send us to a fiery abyss. He's not angry at you, disappointed in you, or holding your mistakes above your head. God said, I, yes, I am He who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. It's Isaiah 43, 25. And He also says, and I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. Hebrews 8, 12. You see, just as much of the history and wealth of Wales was stolen away from the chapter house at Margham Abbey, much of our understanding about the truth of who God is has been stolen away by the dark specter of religion. We're taught to fear God because of our perceived failures and to hide away from Him. And then we're taught that we're supposed to try and buy Him off with our good works. But that's not who He is or what He desires. Yes, God is a God of justice and righteousness, and He is holy. And God definitely doesn't care much for sin. But Moses described God as the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And that was Moses' poor and limited, purely human understanding about God. But Jesus, who knows a bit more about God than any other being in existence, <laughs> described God a different way. Jesus called God something that a first century Jew would have thought of as absolutely revolutionary. Jesus called God Father. Prior to Jesus, God was not referred to as an intimate father. Sure, to a first century Jew, God was titled the father of the poor, the orphan, and the widow. God was the lawgiver and the helper and judge of Israel. He was thought of as a father in the world in regard to creation and his covenant role as father of Israel, his chosen people. But for the first century Hebraic mindset, God's title as father was simply a metaphor, just like it is for most of us today. But Jesus referred to God as a father in the literal sense. And Jesus showed that God wasn't a distant father who was angry with his kids like everyone thought. He was a father who was passionate and desired an active relationship with his children. Jesus said that God was not far away, nor was he withholding. God was actively seeking his children like a shepherd does his sheep, calling them to him, calling them home to his kingdom that he was establishing on earth through his son. God doesn't set up barriers between Himself and His children. God demolished and ripped up barriers with the arrival, sacrifice, and resurrection of Jesus, His beloved. And Jesus proclaimed something even more radical, that when we believed in Him, saw Him for who He was, and believed in what He did for us with His sacrifice and resurrection, we gain the right to be called children of God, because now we have access to the Father through Him. Now, let's pause because it's right here that the nasty religious spirit typically creeps up, begins to twist and manipulate and say something like, well, Jesus is the reason God loves you. But that's not the truth. That's a thief trying to steal the truth from you. The truth is, is that Jesus came to show us how much God loves us. Jesus came to show you the truth about your father. For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son. We must see God for who He really is, a Father radically in love with you.
because of the Father's love, because of Jesus' love, you have the freedom of the kingdom of God, which is a revelation of new identity as a son or daughter, bringing an end to the worldly and religious idea of separation from God. God isn't distant. Father is not far away. God was and is today restoring to his children the truth of their birthright. And it's not something you can earn. It's a free gift. And now, because of our reestablishment as children of God, now we do the work of the kingdom because it is our family business. We don't do works, donate lands, and build monasteries to achieve salvation. And we don't attempt to buy God off with gifts and titles. And we don't have to curry favor. Now we do the works of the kingdom because they're a natural overflow of our heart and identity. We do the work of the kingdom and we give of ourselves because of what we are, children of God. When you truly come alive because of Jesus and have faith in the reality of what He has done, the work of the kingdom becomes an overflow of your renewed heart and mind. This understanding of God and His desired relationship with us was a complete paradigm shift for the first century Jew. And in truth, it's much the same 2,000 years later. And when you know whose you are, you can begin to become who you are. When you see God for who He really is, the Father who loves His children, everything changes, and what was stolen becomes reclaimed. God doesn't care how much land you give, how many orphanages you build, how many charities you start, how many folks you lead to Him, or how much money you give to His church. If He doesn't have your heart, if you don't know Him, it's all hay and stubble. He wants you to see Him as He is. He wants you to see His goodness and His love and His mercy. Because He knows if you see it and receive it, that is where you will find your salvation. And when we see Jesus, we see Him. After all, Jesus even said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Salvation can't be earned, it's a gift. When we read the word salvation in the Bible, that word in Greek is sozo, which means a complete package of salvation, deliverance, and healing. Salvation isn't a magic prayer and a get out of hell free card, as we often treat it and has been sold to us by snake oil salesmen and swindlers. Sozo is healing from the inside out of the soul, an infilling of the spirit, a washing away of the old, and the cool refreshment of being a new Kainos creation. Salvation is stepping into and transforming us into our true reality, that of a child of God. And this is a gift given to us by a loving God who made us in His image, creative beings who have it within us to sculpt the world with His glory. And that's Genesis 1.28. You don't need to buy your way into God's favor. The truth is that you already exist in Him. You don't need to earn God's love because you already have it. And when you really understand that, when you accept that in your journey, and when that mustard seed starts to sprout in your heart, all of a sudden what changes is your ability to see and receive your Father's love for you. Jesus didn't come to change God's mind about the world. Jesus came to change the world's mind and God's children's mind about their Father, because He first loved us. It's time for you to reclaim what was stolen. It's time for you to take the next step of your journey. It's time for you to see your Father for who He really is. Ask Him to show you how much He loves you. Imagine the span of swirling galaxies, the brilliant stars, the revolving planets, all of creation, and realize, yes, He created those wonderful things to shine, but He created you to love, to walk with you, to spend eternity with you, to dance with you, because your Father loves you. Begin to receive that, and then your journey can truly begin. What do fairy tales, vengeful ghosts, 
flying witches, powerful wizards, and an English lord who actually assisted in the capture of the Scottish rebel William Wallace and personally witnessed a resurrection of someone he executed twice all have in common. I'll give you a big hint. They feature this same ruined Welsh castle, one literally dangling off the edge of a cliff. Legend has it that Pennard Castle, high above jaw-dropping Three Cliffs Bay, was destroyed by a magic sandstorm during the cursed wedding of its evil lord. But while this place was the alleged site of a wedding gone epically bad, thankfully you and I are going to take part in a much greater wedding together. And the guest list is huge. And in this wedding, the Lord of all creation is waiting to take us in His arms and hold us close in His heart forever. And all you have to do is take the next step on the journey. Welcome to Pinard Castle, situated on a cliff's edge high above Three Cliffs Bay, voted one of the most beautiful beaches in the entire world. And if you couldn't tell, I love fairy tales. There's just something about folklore and legend that always fires up my imagination. And Pinard Castle is a fairy tale castle come to life. From tales of wild wizards, dark lords, vengeful fairies, and weddings gone horribly wrong. These stones have so many romantic tragedies associated with them, it seems like they've walked out of a best-selling fantasy series. Once upon a time, a terrified wizard crafted a castle on a cliff out of thousands of nearby stones to protect the people from an invading army. Many years later, a fierce warrior chieftain turned lord took possession of the castle. At a time when the neighbouring lands were engulfed in wars, the cruel lord prospered. Word spread of his success and ruthless power in battle when a local prince with war-torn lands came begging for aid. The payment? His daughter's hand. On the night of the wedding supper, the drunken warlord seized his unwilling bride, dragging her to his tower to consummate the union, all the while unaware of the commotion unfolding outside. Fairies. A fantasy of mischievous fairies. When the fairies arrived at the castle gates to join the celebration, the guards, suspicious of the unexpected guests, sought their master's approval. This interruption threw the lord into a drunken rage and he ordered the visitors to be slaughtered, but before a hand was laid upon any of them, the fairies began to work powerful magic, conjuring a terrible sandstorm, pulling sands from as far away as Ireland to swallow the clifftop castle and nearby village. The cruel lord and his people were buried alive, and nothing was left but mountains of sand and ruins. The story of Pinard Castle's cursed wedding has circulated for hundreds of years and is entrenched in local folklore, a warning to not anger the fairies who call this land their own. But the tales of ruined Pinard Castle don't just stop with a cursed wedding. Stories abound of a young vengeful female ghost who roams this land, rumored to be a maiden who threw herself from the cliffs long ago. And those unfortunate enough to come face to face with her reportedly become gripped with her insanity. And let's not forget the Witch of Reben, the Welsh Banshee who makes Three Cliffs Bay her home, terrifying nighttime passerbys with her horrendous and deadly shrieks and moans. Like I said, this place has no shortage of stories. I mean, just look at it. If your imagination isn't inspired here, then something is wrong. But the truth is, not a single one of these fairy tales are based on real events. The first castle here was built by a marcher lord named Henry de Beaumont. Like other English marcher lords hungry for Welsh lands, Henry was vicious in suppressing the local Welsh princes, establishing fortifications throughout South Wales in the early 1100s. In the early 13th century, the castle lands came under the control of the de Braus family, and William de Braus had a claim to fame all throughout the British Isles, as one of the lords who captured the Scottish rebel, William Wallace, at the Battle of Falkirk. 
Not only was de Braus famous for capturing William Wallace, de Braus captured many Welsh heroes, including one by the name of William Cray, who de Braus had to execute twice and who is still resurrected the day after his final execution. And that's not just local legend, that miracle is actually on file in the Vatican archives. After taking control of Pinard Castle, de Braus upfitted the walls with gate towers with the express goal of intimidating the Welsh. And while it wasn't a formidable castle, it did fulfill its purpose. Over its history, there's no record that Pinard Castle ever tasted battle or siege. But the castle did have an enemy that would topple its walls, sand. The shifting dunes of the beaches below, timed with freak sandstorms that did originate in Ireland during the late 1400s, spelled doom for Pinard Castle. Sweeping winds and sands eroded the masonry between the stones, and by the 1500s, Pinard was abandoned to the elements and left to a sandy demise. By the mid-18th century, the ruins of Pinard Castle were considered a derelict place for romantics and often found itself the subjects of engravings, sketches, and paintings. It's a place that lends itself to fanciful stories. And as most people that visited here before didn't know the actual history of the area, these ideas, they came to be accepted as truth of sorts, particularly concerning the marriage of the evil lord and the fairy attack on the castle. After all, who doesn't like a good fairy tale? And who doesn't like stories of interesting weddings? But while Pinard Castle has become well known for its mythical wedding gone heinously bad, there's another wedding you may not know much about, one that actually has to do with you. And it's no fairy tale. It's the real deal. You see, you may not know it, but you're invited to the wedding to end all weddings, the greatest wedding that the universe has ever seen. It's a wedding between Jesus and his bride, which is the church. Now, when I say church, I don't mean the buildings. I'm talking about the collective, the ecclesia, the called out ones, those that know his voice. It's God's people that make up the church, and together we are the bride. But in this mystery, according to Jesus in Matthew 25, you are also being called individually to be prepared to walk that aisle. So that means it's not just about the collective, it's about you. You are the bride, and Jesus, he's the groom. Jesus says the bridegroom. Sure, that sounds good, but come on, what does that really mean? Let's move past the head knowledge and slam this into your heart because it's important. And if you don't start getting this, your journey will never be what it could be. Think about it. Jesus as the groom and you as the bride. Knowing Jesus as a groom, a husband. I mean, it's one thing to know about Jesus as a savior and someone we're supposed to pray to and serve and all that stuff. And I'm not saying those things are wrong, but we're invited to know him deeper. We're invited to know Jesus as a bride knows the husband. And it doesn't get more intimate than that, does it? That's not the picture of Jesus we're used to. Religion has twisted our perception of Jesus, thinking his love is something that must be earned or worked for and that we're being graded out on how hard we work and sacrifice. We're used to seeing him hanging on a cross or made to feel like we must suffer in guilt and shame. Or worse, we live in fear of his angry judgment. Can you earn real love? Is he really grading you out and keeping a list of what you're doing wrong and right? Is Jesus still hanging on a cross? And is he waiting to marry you just so he can punish you? Let's strip this thing down and hold it up to the light. Does that sound like a good marriage to you? Does your significant other make you work for their love, force you into submission, use guilt to get their way, shame your decisions, or threaten you with their wrath? Does that sound like a loving, doting partner? Does that sound like a relationship we would even want to be a part of? What if most people walking the planet who say they love Jesus actually have no idea of what Jesus' love really is? What if we don't know what real love is? I mean, that's a frightening thought. Most of us have love and fear so intertwined that we don't know what love actually is. 
But John wrote, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. The one who fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. That's 1 John 4, 18 through 19. So let's actually talk about something that we think we know a lot about, but actually don't. Let's discuss God's love, which is Jesus' love, the kind of love a groom has for his bride. One of the concepts we have to grasp on our journey with Christ is that our modern translations of ancient Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, the original primary languages of the Bible, they often lack in their ability to carry the full weight of what the original writers of the text intended. Yet in Scripture, there are actually five words that are defined as love. One Hebrew, four Greek, each carrying a different connotation and specific meaning. There is ahava, a Hebrew word that describes emotionally intense bonds and covenantal relationships. Agapeo, a Greek word that means preferential and unconditional love, usually presented as of God Himself which isn't based upon the goodness of the person who receives it are in response to what they've done. This is the love that God has for His children. There's agape, similar to agapeo. And agape is love between people, love of people for God, and God's love for humanity as a whole. There's philia, which is a Greek word that expresses the feeling of love, friendship, affection, and personal attachment. Philia is not commanded as agape is because Feelings can't be commanded. They must be a natural flow from the heart. And finally, there's Philadelphia, which is the love someone has for a brother or sister, the love that members of the church body are supposed to have for one another. Now, these examples are just found in the Bible. In ancient Greece, there were nine words that represented different forms of love that English speakers, we all attempt to group under one term, love. Now, why is this a big deal? Well, it's not a big deal. It is the deal. When you understand that when John wrote, for God so loved the world in John 3.16, and he used the word agapeo, you realize that John wasn't just using the word love to imply a feeling, you know, like we do. John was saying God's love was unconditional towards the object of his affection, a constant perfect love not based upon a whim, a love that sought after the best for all, even when the subjects of his love did nothing to deserve his love. You cannot earn it, and it never goes away. What changes is that when we begin to even partially understand this agape o love in as much as we could ever understand something so divinely miraculous, we can then begin to be able to receive and partake of that love. In fact, when John used the word agape o in the context of 1 John 4, 8, it translates as a love feast. God's love for us is like a yummy, luscious feast where all the most desirous pleasures of the universe are placed on an endless table before us. And the right to take part of this agapeo, this marriage supper of God's affection, this type of love, it doesn't come from what we do, or how hard we work, or who we think we are. This love, this invitation to the spectacular marriage supper of the Lamb, comes from who He says we are, and from what His Son has done for us. When God promised that He would never leave us nor forsake us, he wasn't just making it up because it sounded eloquent. That is actually the love that He has for us. We're never alone, never separated, even when the world tells us otherwise, even when it feels otherwise. God is always there. I mean, wow, I mean, that's absolutely remarkable. And it will flush away a lifetime of bad theology if you let it. This is the type of love that took the first century church's breath away. It was a completely new way to understand God's passion for humanity, personified in Jesus. The prophecy of His coming, His birth, His life, His death, His resurrection, and His sitting down at the right hand of the Father who adores His children. It's a love that could not, would not stay in the grave, and would defy the physical rules of life with supernatural power and expectancy. Even if your world falls apart, even if you're tortured, imprisoned unjustly, even if worldly circumstances begin to batter and bruise you, His love for you will not, cannot stop. His love is the foundation of everything for a true follower of Christ. This is a rock to build upon. Love is not an aspect of God. God is love, 
And love is so much more than what we've been taught. And God's love never changes. And this is the love of a perfect groom for his bride. Seeing Jesus this way may be new to you. I know it was for me. Even though I had grown up in Christian households and I had read the Bible back and forth plenty of times, I didn't understand Jesus this way. Even after leaving the faith and coming back to it years later, I still didn't know Him this way. I could argue, debate, revelate, preach, and pray with the best of them, but I still didn't understand His love this way. And in some ways, I didn't want to. Intimacy can be a scary thing for those of us that have been deeply wounded. It was easier to clothe myself in rules and rituals, dogma and judgment, than it was to open up my heart for the grandest adventure I could ever dream. I knew the scriptures. I knew what I had been told and taught, but I, I didn't have a true picture of His love. I had it locked in my head, but barely there in my heart. All I could see was my sin, my shortcomings, how often I missed the mark, how hard I was told I had to work, and how hard I was jockeying for position in the Christian world. In truth, I looked at my relationship with him as a worker bee, always wondering what his will for my life was and jumping from task to task. But that's not what he wants. He wants so much more. He wanted me to rest in him with my head against his chest, just as his favorite disciple did when he walked upon the earth. And he wants that with you. And he wants you to see yourself the way that he sees you. And as far as his will for your life goes, his will is to be close to you and to know you. He even says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. You can do all the amazing things in the world, but if you don't know him intimately, it's all hay and stubble. You can learn about his love all day, but if you aren't realizing that love personally and releasing it to others, it's, it's all for naught. I can give you a book about beautiful churches. You can learn everything there is to know about them, height, dimensions, history, who worked on them, who designed them, all about the frescoes and paintings within them, everything. Yet for all that knowledge, if you don't go to those places yourself and experience them, you don't know them. You don't know how they smell, you don't know how the dust catches the light at a certain time of day when the sun streams through their windows. You don't know the interplay of the shadows and light on the stones and wood, deepening the atmosphere. I can give you a book about love, and you can memorize everything there is to know about the book, but until you actually experience love for yourself, it's just stuff in your head. I can give you a book about God's love, and you can memorize everything, chapter and verse. But until you experience His love yourself, the love of a groom for His bride, and the love of a bride for the groom, then your interpretation of His love will always be through someone else's eyes. Until you know Him as the groom, your view will always be askew. Our world is suffering because we don't read His incredible words through the eyes of true love, the love of a husband for His bride. There are many teachers and pastors who are amazing in their duties, but they don't know the love of the groom. There are many that say they love him and haven't experienced the fullness of his love because they haven't been shown how. They don't know it's possible to be so free. They don't know what resting in him looks like. He wants us to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love others as we love ourselves. And that means all the way moving into union with him as in marriage. And that's because marriage is an earthly model of a heavenly reality, the reality of Christ's love for His church. Did you think that it was a coincidence that Jesus' first public miracle took place at a wedding? His transformation of water into wine, the best wine available. It's symbolic of life recreated and raised up to new levels, the best possible, life given purpose and meaning. Two things becoming one. There's going to be a wedding. And it's time for you to journey down the aisle. And you don't have to go to fairy tale castles on windswept hills to get it. You are His. You've always been His. This is your true reality. The bridal chorus is sounded. The angels in the cloud of witnesses are standing. 
and they wait with expectation for your walk down the aisle. Your groom is waiting with outstretched hand. It's time for you to take your place and walk forward. Your journey has just begun. Many ancient cultures believed in thin places, places where the very fabric of physical reality intersected with that of the supernatural. Places where a person could walk within two worlds, that of the sacred and secular, the transcendent and the common, places where two worlds became one. Some describe thin places as spaces where humanity experiences God more often. Others are more fanciful with their language, describing thin places as locales where the distance between heaven and earth collapses. Come with me today as we experience the awe and wonder of one of Pembrokeshire Wells' most fascinating megalithic monuments in thin places, the Dolmen of Pintra Ivan, a site that the ancients, and not so ancients, believed to be a portal between two dimensions, that of the physical and the supernatural realms. What could such a place reveal to us about our own journey with Jesus? You just might be surprised, because after today, you're gonna to realize that thin places and portals between worlds are a lot more common and a whole lot closer than you think. Welcome to Pintra Evan, arguably the most well-known prehistoric monument in Wales and a source of national pride and identity. Built between 4000 and 3500 BC, this megalith was in place hundreds of years before Stonehenge was erected and predates the first pyramids of Egypt by a thousand years. We're literally standing at a gate of history that's over 6,000 years old, a mysterious locale that still holds tightly to its secrets, ensconced in equal parts history and fantasy. For thousands of years, humans have come here in an attempt to touch another world, believing this place was a portal between the natural and supernatural realms. Pintra Evans sits atop the gentle rolling hills of southwest Wales, within view of the famed Priscilla Mountains, the source of Stonehenge's famous bluestones and the stones of this monument. And to the west is Carn Ingli, the ancient hill fort where the Celtic Saint Brennach met and conversed with angels in the 12th century. Pintra Evan is sacred land, which if you haven't picked up on this by now, is not an uncommon theme throughout Wales. It's called God's country for a reason after all. And this area of Wales archeologic record proves this out. Over 526 ancient monuments, that's right, 526 of them dot the immediate landscape around this monument. And Pintra Evan stands tall over many of them. Pintra Evan is a dolmen a prehistoric megalithic tomb or burial chamber with a large flat stone atop upright ones. But while dolmens are common throughout Britain, France, and Ireland, Pincher Evan is very unique. Pincher Evan is massive compared to other dolmens throughout the British Isles. Its capstone weighs more than 17 tons and measures 16 and a half feet long. It's delicately balanced over eight feet off the ground by the tips of three tapering upright stones. And this balance is so precise that at certain angles, it appears as if the massive 34,000 pound overhead rock is floating. But you don't have to worry about it falling. Pincher Evan has stood longer than humanity's recorded history and makes the pyramids of Egypt look young in comparison. Adding to Pincher Evan's mystery is that no one knows exactly how Pincher Evan was built. How did ancient humans without modern crane equipment move a 17 ton stone from the Briseli Hills miles away and then lift it precisely into place atop three other perfectly placed stones to redistribute the weight upon such narrow points. Well, there's no shortage of theories, some of which get pretty crazy, but the truth is we have absolutely no idea. Yeah. 
Yet while we don't know exactly how Pincher Evan was built, what we do know is that these seven standing stones were once part of a much larger complex. Major excavations have revealed that this megalith was originally covered in a trapezoidal mound of earth that was over 120 feet long and ran down the hill. Inside the structure were tunnels and antechambers, and outside was a crescent-shaped forecourt whose purpose remains a mystery. Basically, the builders of Pincher Ivan literally raised the top of the hill an additional 10 feet high by raising incredibly large stones and bringing in untold tons of soil and rock, carting it all uphill no less, then carving out chambers and tunnels throughout. This was a massive building project that must have taken generations to complete. To pull something like this off took incredible organization, intelligence, and the ability to motivate large groups of people over extended periods of time. But that begs the question, why? There was purpose, vision, and strategy at work here, and it wasn't done on a whim. What possessed ancient man to take on such a massive and complex undertaking? Many believe Pincher Ivan was built to honor the dead. Historians claim that these stones are the skeletal remains of what originally may have been a Neolithic community's burial chamber. And while that makes sense on the surface, as the vast majority of dolmens are indeed burial chambers, under closer examination, serious questions arise regarding Pincher Ivan as a burial site. First, if Pincher Ivan was a tomb, how come bones have never been discovered here? Even after two major excavations, not a single bone fragment has been uncovered. If it was a community burial chamber, one would assume that bones would have been discovered here, but none exist. Also, burial chambers across Europe are typically oriented east to west, marking the movement of the sun across the sky. But Pincher Ivan is oriented north-south. And angles of Pincher Ivan's forecourt are much larger than tombs throughout the British Isles, leaving many to believe Pincher Ivan held a unique role with its builders, potentially as a cult site for worship. In complicating things further, while Pincher Evan may have originally been a tomb, sources claim that thousands of years after its construction, this complex was given a new purpose, a Druidic Initiation Center. With 526 ancient monuments within throwing distance of this site, it's obvious that this region was sacred to the Celts and those that came thousands of years before them. These lands are still claimed today as being the heart of the Druidic world, and belief in ancient magic is still common here. Ancient Druids acted as priests, doctors, herbalists, teachers, scholars, and judges. Druidic men and women dictated the flow of life in this part of the world, and were the bridge between the unseen spiritual world and the physical. Local tradition holds that Pincher Evan was used as a place of initiation into the Druidic order, where initiates were placed into its darkened chambers to undergo rituals before emerging and being born again into their new life. And there's strong evidence for this. While no bones have ever been found on site, evidence of fire pits, fires, torch marks, ashes, and more have been uncovered here. If Pincher Evan was a tomb, then why did ancient humans need light inside of it? And to top things off, as recently as the 1950s, Pincher Evan was called the Womb of Caridwen, who was a Celtic deity that ancient Druids worshipped as the goddess of inspiration, wisdom, and prophecy. Pincher Evan, to those that believe in its powers, is a place where the ancients believed they could move between worlds, the human realm and the other world, a portal to a land filled with fantastic creatures, gods and goddesses, and spiritual powers beyond belief. As you can imagine, because of the mysteries surrounding Pitcher Evan, it's long been associated with strange phenomena. Glowing orbs, which locals call fairy lights, are often seen here. Green fireballs have even been posted on social media. And some report these lights take the shape of human-like creatures, some even wearing the clothing of otherworldly soldiers. Other times, figures are seen wearing ceremonial robes, dancing about the stones. And legend has it that if you witness these fairy beings on the night of a full moon and are unlucky enough to hear their beautiful song, you'll be swept up in their dancing 
and be taken to their world permanently. Some believe this area is a UFO hotspot filled with strange lights that fly in formations in impossible speeds. And the most common claim here, however, is that during certain astronomical alignments or weather events, people claim to feel lightheaded or weak in the knees. Electronic equipment is said to malfunction, and some say when looking through these stones, their vision shimmers as if they're catching a glimpse into another world. Pintra Evan has quite a romantic reputation. Associated with ancient and mythical peoples, gods and goddesses, druids, Celts, you name it. This site is the very definition of a thin place where the space between worlds comes crashing together. And at Pintra Evan, this is literally supposed to happen. Knowing the history and folklore of this place and standing here underneath these stones, it can be overwhelming, awe-inspiring, and in some ways is the very substance of what dreams are made of. In the words of a favorite villain in a favorite film, we're merely passing through history. But this, this is history. A 6,000-year-old doorway between worlds where the ancients believed they could cross the supernatural threshold and enter the realm of the gods. But for all its beauty, grandeur, and mystery, I just have to smile to myself. For literal millennia, people have been coming to Pincher Evan seeking to touch the other world, searching for a touch of the divine. But they're really missing out. For while there is a mystery to behold here, the truth is these stones can never be what you are. And while this amazing megalith has stories to tell, this monument will never conduct the raw spiritual energy that you contain. And even if one could access another world by walking through this dolmen's portal stones, that world pales in comparison to the world that can be released through you. Because you don't have to go anywhere to search out a thin place. In fact, I'm gonna show you right now where the most powerful thin place you will ever personally experience is. You ready? Go find a mirror, look in it, and say these mighty words. I am the thin place. Because you are the thin place where worlds collide. One of the greatest lessons you'll learn on your journey is what you carry inside of you. When you begin to realize who your Father in Heaven is, when you begin to know what His Son has done and makes available to you, and when you begin to realize who you are, a monumental and tectonic shift begins to take place. After all, when you embrace the fact that you have free and unfettered access to the ultimate power inside and outside the universe, and that power is inside of you, things are going to start changing. You are the thin place where the power of God, the love of the Father, and resurrection power comes together. You are the sacred place. Yes, Pintra Evan is a 6,000-year-old monument older than Stonehenge in the pyramids of Egypt. And it is amazing. But guess what's older? You. The real you. Not this flesh and bone body, but the spirit that dwells inside of you. After all, God knew you before the foundation of the world, according to Ephesians 1.4. When we look at the Psalms and read 24.9, Lift up your heads, ye gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Guess what? That's you. The ultimate power of the universe dwells inside of you and through you. You are the gate that the King steps into this world through. The Creator who created everything and created you in His image has called you to realize who you really are. An atmosphere changer, a releaser of His glory and presence so that His love and passion flows out of you like a river of living water. Your spirit is older than this monument and when these stones crumble to dust in a few million years, your spirit will still be around. Your spirit, who you really are, exists outside of time in the heavenly realm, raised up with and seated with Christ in heavenly places in union with His spirit. Now, most of us aren't taught this stuff when we're sitting in our stuffy religious boxes. 
We're taught that we're lowly worms who have to work hard to become what God requires us to be. That we have to act a certain way or talk a certain way or jump through hoops to usher in the kingdom of God. We're taught that sacred places are places we go or have to seek out, pay pilgrimage to or have to build out of our own power. But that's not what Jesus said. After being asked when the kingdom of God would come in Luke 17, 21, Jesus says the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. And this is a big deal. And there are actually three ways to translate what Jesus says here. Some translations say within you, others say in your midst, and others say among you. And all three translations are correct in their own way, but this is what those translations mean. Number one, the kingdom of God is inside of you and you must seek it. Number two, the kingdom is within your reach. And number three, the kingdom of God is in your midst in the person and presence of Jesus who's inside of us. Ephesians 3, 17, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Galatians 2, 20, and Colossians 1, 27. The kingdom of God won't be found by looking for it in a geographical location. It's not in monuments. And the sacred isn't locked in stones. And it's not about building a building to house the glory of God, even though buildings are good for gathering together. Rather, the kingdom exists in us, in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls and spirits, and you are the space between worlds. So, knowing the kingdom of God is within, do you release the kingdom and become a stream of living water? Or do you hold it all inside and become a dead sea? There's a really dramatic scene during Christ's crucifixion where Jesus offers himself up for all. And at the moment of Jesus' physical death, he cries out in a loud voice and yields his spirit. And Matthew 27, 51 tells us in that moment that the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. The earth shook and rocks split apart. And most of us have heard this story. And sure, we read about it or see a dramatic reenactment during Easter ceremonies and go, yeah, power of God, baby. But this is the thing. There's so much in this moment for you and your journey that you might be missing. To the people of Jesus' day, the temple was all important. It was where people came to experience the presence of God and to offer sacrifices and tribute. It was a sacred place, a thin place. Some would say the thin place of all thin places. After all, the God of the universe would actually enter this temple and reside one day out of the year in the Holy of Holies. At that time, it didn't get much more thin than that. But things were about to change. Now, the Temple of Jerusalem was made up of three basic parts, the outer court, the inner court, and the Holy of Holies. Between the inner court and the Holy of Holies, there was a thick curtain that separated the two areas. Only the high priest would be allowed to enter the Holy of Holies once a year on Yom Kippur to offer incense and sacrifice to God. And if the high priest wasn't ritually pure, in all ways, he would drop dead due to all of the awe of God in the room. Now, this curtain wasn't some sheer drape or flimsy little piece of fabric. The veil between the Holy of Holies and the inner court was a blue, scarlet, and purple, heavily embroidered curtain over four inches thick, 60 feet long, and 30 feet wide. And it took 300 priests to move and manipulate it. And embroidered on the veil were all the things that were mystical in the heavens, according to Josephus. This curtain was a literal fabric wall. You just didn't push this thing out of the way. This curtain, if it fell on you, killed you. The veil was designed to keep the Holy of Holies separate from the rest of the courts. It was for man's protection and to keep an area sacred and set apart. This is the curtain that was split top to bottom in Matthew 27, 51 upon Jesus yielding up his spirit. It wasn't some little flimsy thing. This was a four inch thick fabric wall that was violently torn by God's presence breaking forth. The whole thing torn asunder top down by God's power. No longer would there be separation, literal or symbolic, from God and His children. 
the literal fabric that symbolized sacredness in space-time, all things mystical in the heavens, was ripped apart by God. God's presence wasn't just going to visit a temple for one holy day out of the year anymore. God's children were going to have the potential to carry His very presence every single day. Paul says that we're made up of three basic components, a body, a soul, and spirit, just as the temple of Jerusalem was made of three parts. Your physical body is like the outer court, your soul is the inner court, and your spirit is the Holy of Holies, where God moves through you. Now, when you start this journey with Christ as a child of God, part of this process is learning that if our spirits indeed are seated in Christ and He's within us, guess what? The veil is torn. We're now God's home on earth. You are now God's temple. You have the Holy of Holies within you where His presence resides. But if all this sounds crazy, don't just take my word for it. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 3.16 Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a great price. So glorify God in your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Ephesians 2, 21 through 22. And you are living stones that God is building into His spiritual temple. What's more, you are His holy priests. 1 Peter 2, 5. And don't forget what Jesus said. The kingdom of God is within you. You are the thin place. You are united with Jesus and He lives in you. He's in union with you. You're God's holy temple. You are the ark of the covenant. You're the mercy seat of Christ. All of these things that were outside in the old covenantal system are now inside you. The veil's been torn. The Holy Spirit moves through your spirit, which is seated in Christ, through your soul into your physical body to be released, literally changing the world with your presence because of the work that's been done through Jesus. When you know whose you are and who you are, you don't have to go to thin places. Just look in the mirror. You are the thin place where the heartbeat and rhythm of your Creator thrums. You don't have to come to rocks on top of hills. You don't have to go climb pyramids. You don't have to sit in a circle and chant Kumbaya, rub crystals together, or go on pilgrimages to holy places. And you don't have to go to the hot new conference or the prophet of the month to experience God. After all, when you feel like He's far away, well, that's just your imagination telling you a lie. Now, does that mean that other earthly thin places aren't real? By no means. Yes, places do have power. Certain places do carry a certain atmosphere. But God doesn't house Himself in places. He's the God who made the world and everything in it. Since He's the Lord of heaven and earth, He doesn't live in man-made temples. And human hands can't serve His needs, for He has no needs. He Himself gives life and breath to everything, and He satisfies every need. I'm not saying there are no earthly thin places, but I am saying that you'll never experience a thin place greater than the one you yourself are. God houses Himself in you. Because did you notice what else happened in Matthew 27, 51? The earth shook and the rocks split. The things that the ancients believed held the power of God, things that people made idols from, wood and stone, they were ripped asunder. They aren't the dwelling place of God. Yes, they are a part of His creation, but God isn't in them. He's in you. You are the thin place. You are the place where heaven and earth collides. And sure, this is all good stuff, but it's fair to ask, how do you experience this for yourself? First step for this part of your journey is that you must acknowledge that it's true. 
you are a thin place. Find that mirror again and take a look. Follow the lines of your face, your eyes, your cheeks, your jaw, your mouth and nose. Realize that you're fearfully and wonderfully made and created to be a dwelling place of God's love. Now say that out loud. Fearfully and wonderfully made and created to be a dwelling place of God's love. Don't worry. All that shame and you discounting yourself, it's all a lie. Let it go. Tell yourself that you are the thin place until you begin to receive it. You have the chance to step through the door that the Lord has placed before you. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Step through. Listen and see how much God loves you. Say it until you feel that love beginning to bubble underneath your skin, making you smile or cry. Letting that cool rush or fiery warmth flush out every lie you've ever told yourself about yourself. And say it until you believe it. You are loved. You are His. You are the thin place. You're now moving past the point of no return. For our next step, we're journeying to the secret place. And once there, you'll never be the same. cordially invited to explore Secret Place, a place between only you and God. It's a secret place made possible by a bridegroom, a place where you can dwell to commune and partner with your Creator, a place of protection and safety, but more than that, a place of intimacy and adoration. But few enter the secret place knowingly. Even fewer know such a place exists, their secret place buried under distractions, hidden under misconceptions, and entrances concealed by a lack of intimate teaching. Today, we're venturing to the mysterious and massive ruins of Neath Abbey in Neath Wells, where a room that's been hidden for over 800 years was recently opened, revealing its secrets to the world at long last. And while there, we're gonna open the door of your own secret place, a bridal chamber prepared for you to delight in and enter into incredible union with God Himself. And trust me, that's something you don't want to miss. Join me on the journey. Welcome to Neath Abbey, the jaw-dropping ruin of one of the most powerful religious sites of medieval wells. The ruins of Neath Abbey are some of the most extensive monastic remains in all of Britain, and literally the entire footprint of the abbey's buildings still exist today, demonstrating the enormity of this community. Neath Abbey is an archaeological treasure, and at one point was the largest abbey in all of Wales, visited by royalty assaulted during rebellions, and was even the hiding place of an outlaw English king, and for 200 years was a storage site for over 7,000 tons of industrial waste. But to understand the abbey, one has to know a little bit about the town in which it sits, and the ancient market town of Neath has a rich history. Written records of Neath began with the establishment of a large Roman fort in the first century. But dark-skinned and curly-haired Celts, called the Seyurs, claimed these lands as their own long before, building Iron Age hill forts in the hills above and sacrificing to the river gods below for over 1,000 years. After Rome abandoned Wales in the fourth century, the Christian faith that they left behind, it began to differentiate itself from the Church of Rome. And the Celtic Christian faith would thrive here for another 600 years. In fact, the eventual patron saint of the Irish, St. Patrick, was born scant miles from here in the early 5th century. During the English Marcher Lord invasion of 1091, one of the infamous 12 Knights of Glamorgan, Richard I de Grenville, 
seized these lands and was charged with subjugating the Welsh people for the English crown. And in 1129, Grenville donated 8,000 acres of land to Norman monks to establish a monastery here, in exchange for a little church favor, of course. It was this monastery that would become the wonder that was known as Neath Abbey, helping to establish Roman Catholicism as the dominant faith of the area for over 400 years. The abbey was viewable for miles around and was the grandest complex in the region. Neath Abbey did so well, it was even visited by England's King John in 1210. And by the end of the 13th century, Neath Abbey was one of the wealthiest in Wales. Even King Edward II, after being forced from his throne and into hiding, in 1326 found refuge at Neath Abbey before moving on to Carefilly, where he was later captured by the crown. But the Abbey's days of wealth and grandeur would not remain. By the 14th century, Neath Abbey was under constant attack by starving Welsh rebels. The Abbey came to be viewed as a sign of English oppression and not to mention a source of valuable resources. After the Welsh revolts were put down by the English, the countryside was ravaged by England's slash and burn retaliation for rebellion. And the Abbey's wealth plummeted and its care soon outweighed its profitability. The Abbey's death stroke came in 1536 when King Henry VIII forced through the Dissolution of the Monasteries Act, effectively seizing all Catholic holdings for the crown. And in 1539, the Abbey's doors were closed forever. The seized Abbey was soon purchased by Sir Richard Williams, a member of Henry VIII's court. And by 1600, the Abbey passed to another owner who remodeled the cloisters into a Tudor-style mansion. Yet by 1750, the mansion was in ruin with legends saying that the stones of the abbey were cursed by the exiled monks forced from the property generations before. By the late 1700s, with the Industrial Revolution in full swing, the ruined abbey was put to rather grim use as a storage site for industrial waste, engulfing the remaining walls of the abbey in slag and trash. And by the early 20th century, the wonder that was Neath Abbey was nothing more than an industrial waste pit. But all wasn't lost. In the 1920s, Baron Walter Rice, who had come into ownership of the property, was intrigued by what may lie beneath the tons of garbage on site. And he authorized the Neath Antiquarian Society to excavate. And over the next 11 years, the amateur archeologists removed over 14 million pounds of hazardous materials by hand, revealing the remains that we see today. Eagle-eyed observers can still see the plaques along the walls that mark the height of the industrial waste that was removed almost 100 years ago. In 1944, the abbey was given into the hands of the government. And now, Neath Abbey is open to the public, ripe for exploration. But Neath Abbey wasn't yet ready to share all of her secrets with the world. Recently, an 800-year-old chamber, previously off-limits, was open to the public revealing a look into the lives of those who once called medieval Neath Abbey home. And while this chamber is currently undergoing upfitting, it will soon be open once again for visitors to experience its glory. During its time as a monastery, this area was used as the day room where the monks worked. And after the monastery was dissolved, it was used as a servant's hall for the Tudor mansion that was here. The intimate work of the abbey went on here. And this large chamber with its stunning vaulted roof and piers running down the center of the room, gives us a glimpse of the grandeur that was here during the height of the Abbey's power. Soon to be beautifully restored, this secret place will allow us an intimate look into living history, enabling us to see through the eyes of those that came before 800 years ago. Wow. Isn't it amazing? For hundreds of years, a sealed room has been here, closed off from the public, a secret place hidden amongst formidable walls and stones. If you didn't know it was here, you could completely miss it, just as most have who've come before. Yet here it is. Only those who know how to look for this place can find it. And even then, only those that have the key can access it, dwell in it, enjoy it, and experience it. Wow. This is incredible. This secret place has existed since the first monks walked here, through the rise and fall of a church's power, through rebellions, through transition into private hands, and even after being buried under millions of pounds of industrial waste. 
This beautiful chamber is an incredible find and a revelation. In your own journey, there exists your very own secret place, available to only you, a secret place between you and God. Both Psalm 27 and 31 both mention the secret place as a very real place of protection where God offers his shelter to a believer in need. And that's amazing. As God's children, we're offered a place of warmth and security in the Father's arms, a place where we're always welcome and protected against what can sometimes be a cold and unsafe world. Psalm 91 goes even further, opening with the epic line, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. This scripture is found in homes, churches, and it's written on covers of more journals than we could ever count. It's a beautiful promise of protection, God's favor and love for us even in times of suffering and pain. Just as a young child runs to their parent in times of need, we're able to run to the arms of our Father any time we choose to. But because it's written as so wonderful, the secret place has become something that people strive for. Endless books are available to teach you how to find it. Sermons have been spoken of how to attain it. Some say you have to have a physical prayer closet to even enter in. And others teach you have to endure endless works to gain access to it. But even worse, some people think that because of their poor choices, they aren't even allowed in and believe they have to fast or serve penance to enter. But what if entry into your secret place isn't difficult? And most importantly, what if the secret place is more than just a place of safety and its purpose is deeper than we've been told or ever dreamed? What if your access to this secret place is lying undetected, just like this room at Neath Abbey, and is just waiting for you to find the key to enter in whenever you feel the desire to feel the Lord's amazing and overwhelming presence and share in His delight? Here's an essential kingdom lesson you must come to understand. Your journey will never be complete until you learn to dwell with God in the secret place. And step one is to realize that the secret place between you and God is a very real thing and is referred to dozens of times in the scriptures. When Moses asked to see God's glory, God told Moses that no man could see God and live. So God allowed Moses to see his glory from the secret place and placed Moses in a cleft in the rock and covered him with his hand until he passed. But now we exist in a new covenant where we are made righteous in Christ. When we want to experience God's presence, the secret place of the heart is where we go to experience His glory. But we're not just invited to go into the secret place every now and then. The promise that God offers us is the opportunity to dwell there. It's a place of meeting that He's prepared for us. It's a place that no matter what is happening in the outside world, within our secret place with God, we can always be open, honest, and trust in Him. Jesus said, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Newsflash here, Jesus was not talking about a physical location. How do we know? Well, Jesus spent plenty of time in the secret place communing with his Father. But Jesus is also the guy who said, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And if he didn't have somewhere to lay his head, chances are he didn't have a prayer closet set up. When Jesus was talking about going to your room, he was speaking of the secret place. The secret place is what the apostles entered into when they sang songs of praise in prison, which later enabled miracles to break forth. The secret place is where Paul entered into, where he was taught by the Lord himself for three years after his conversion. And this same place is open to all believers. And the truth is, you don't need to do a single thing to access it other than to seek Him and rest in Him. Jesus didn't say, if you come to me hungry, you must fast for 40 days before I feed you, or if you're thirsty, you must spend the day on your knees before I give you a drink. He didn't say, you must sit in silence for three days before you can hear my voice. And Jesus never said, if you knock, I'll only answer on Sunday. Jesus never gave any single condition for entering his presence. Jesus said, 
Those who come to him will be fed. Those who are thirsty will be satisfied. Those who listen for him will hear. And most importantly, if we knocked, then the door would be open to us. That's not to mention literally dozens of other verses in the Bible by prophets, disciples, and apostles who promised the same thing, including if we sought him, that we would find him and be rewarded. Not a single one of Jesus' promises are contingent on you undergoing any rituals, going to sacred sites, making pilgrimages, performing works, suffering, or striving. There are no conditions, zero, upon entering into the secret place with him. When your children hurt themselves, do you require them to jump through any hoops to run into your arms? What makes us think that God, who loves us more infinitely than we could ever love anything or anyone else, would make us do those things to enter into his place of meeting? Remember our talk about the thin place? God literally tore the curtain of supposed separation in two, top to bottom. And I promise you, there is no indication in scripture or otherwise that he ever restitched it together and hung it back up. And because of that, we can enter into the secret place of intimacy anytime we desire. Intimacy. It's a scary word and a huge deal. And intimacy with God is something that most of us lack. And this is the crux of why most of us miss out on the beauty that is the secret place. Because we lack intimacy with God, and because we don't know how to access the secret place of the Most High, we use religion, rituals, and rules to try and attain our desires instead. But the beauty of the gospel is its simplicity. And instead of jumping through hoops to enter the secret place with God, you must realize that Jesus himself is the key, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Doctrine and dogma aren't the truth. Our rules and regulations aren't the truth. Our leaders aren't the truth. And people on video screens aren't the truth. Jesus is the truth. And the secret place where we can meet him and experience him intimately is so much more than what we've ever dreamed because safety and security are only part of the equation of what happens when we enter in. I want to show you something fantastic. Pick up any Bible and flip to the center. Chances are you'll come across a book that's not brought up very often in services and is rarely brought up in study groups. Many teachers are uncomfortable discussing it. Most pastors ignore it completely. But it's a book that is essential to revealing the truth about your journey, because in this book is a love song that God has written for you. And this book is called The Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon is a song that expresses the depths of intimacy of two hearts becoming one in union, beating with love for one another. It's an intense love song that's pure and holy, And while it does describe ancient attitudes about intimate relationships, the Song of Solomon reveals the love between Jesus and you. For marriage and romantic love, it's a metaphor that expresses the intimacy Jesus longs to have with you right now. Song of Solomon is the story of a shepherd king who falls in love with a commoner, a woman who feels unworthy of the king's gaze and feels uncomfortable in her skin. She even tells him she's unworthy, saying, Don't gaze at me because I am dark. But even though the woman believes she is lacking, the king doesn't see her as less than. Instead, the king tells her over and over that she is beautiful and lovely, breaking through the walls of her unbelief. Let's face it, sometimes it's hard to believe we're loved by God. Sure, we hear it in our head. It sounds great, but we don't know it in our heart. Like the shepherd king in the Song of Solomon, it is Jesus who reveals his love for us and breaks down our walls. He loves us first. If you don't come to know Jesus intimately, your experience of his love, it'll never move past head knowledge to heart experience. Because it's not about what's in your head, it's about what comes forth from your heart. This is why the Song of Solomon is so important to knowing him and why abiding in his presence in the secret place is essential. 
We may feel unworthy, but it's the love of Jesus that cleanses us of the lies that we believe about ourselves. In the secret place, we come face to face with the fact that in Jesus' eyes, we are beautiful. It's in the secret place, the bridal chamber, that we realize our love is invincible and eternal. This is where we realize I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. And it's in the secret place, the bridal chamber, that this love is made manifest. But here's the thing. The sad truth is that most of us are just plain old uncomfortable with the intimacy of Song of Songs. Our current cultural views of sex and marriage have chucked the marriage bed under 14 million pounds of garbage, just like what the iron foundries did to Neath Abbey. And just like those archaeologists 100 years ago, we've got to dig through the perceived muck and get to the truth. Song of Songs is about the union of Christ and His bride in the secret place, His pursuit of us into the bridal chamber, and the intimacy that He desires with us. And there's nothing pornographic about that. It's beautiful. After all, God says that the marriage bed is pure in Hebrews 13.4. Even the great first century Hebrew scholar Rabbi Akiva said that the greatest day was the one on which Israel received the Song of Songs. And all of the writings in the Bible are holy, and the Song of Songs is the holiest of holies. Because of our hypersexualization as a culture, instead of seeing the double meaning of the ancient love poetry of Song of Songs, we jump to imagining physical copulation between Jesus and His bride. But that's just silly. Let's face it. It's easy for us to see our relationship with Christ as Him being our shepherd, our master, our friend, our savior and Lord. But the deepest relationship we're called to with Christ is with Him as the bridegroom. Hence the dozens and dozens of scriptures referencing this point. And what do brides and bridegrooms do in their bridal chamber, their secret place? Two become one. And this is the true value of the secret place. Knowing His love this way, experiencing the passion the Lord has for us in the secret place, it will redefine your journey in every way. When we realize there's a place where we can experience Him drawing near, we begin to see ourselves the way that He sees us. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, they begin to bloom and our true self, our truest identity, begins to take root. And most importantly, when we intimately know the undefeatable and eternal passion the King has for us, we begin to glimpse our lives from His eternal perspective. We begin to see that God daily falls in love with us, and we have infinite reasons to fall in love with Him, no matter our circumstances or pain. We begin to see the blessings all around us, and to never overlook the beauty that He gives us. It's a realization that the God of the universe, the creator of the elements, the one who put the stars into a spiral motion to mimic the dance steps He made with the Son and the Holy Spirit at the dawn of time, the God who dances over us, He can choose to be anywhere He pleases, and He chooses to dwell with you in the secret place of your heart. He chose you, and He chose me. In any way you slice it, that's an amazing God. And like the shepherd king of Song of Songs, He never promised a life without pain, and He never promised a lack of tragedy. He didn't promise laughter without sorrow, nor did He promise the light of the sun with no rain. But He did say that He would never leave you nor forsake you, and that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He's waiting for you to enter in, into your secret place. Seek and you shall find. Ask and it shall be given to you. The secret place, the bridal chamber, 
It's right there. Knock on the door, enter in. See how he's decorated your secret chamber. It's all for you, your very own place between your God and you. Filled with delights unimaginable, a love feast with all the universe at your fingertips. The spiral galaxies are the lights that hang above. The earth is but a footstool. And see him there with arms outstretched. Lay your head on his willing chest and tell him your fears. Tell him your worries. And listen to him tell you who you really are. You have all the time in the world in this place. You're at the intersection of the finite and the eternal. Take all the time you need. After all, time's inconsequential here. Seconds can be hours, and hours but a breath. Welcome to your new beginning. Enjoy it. Drink in the living water. And when you're ready, I'll see you down the road on the next step of your journey. Gold coins, jewels, and hidden treasures. People spend their lives searching for them, and some have sacrificed everything trying to gain it. For as long as humanity has existed, hidden treasure has been a hot topic, enticing imaginations and fueling dreams. The greatest expeditions ever sent out have been in search of precious metals and stones, and civilizations have risen and fallen on finding treasures and losing them. But what if I told you that the greatest treasures are not hidden in caves, underneath the sands, or beneath the seas. What if gold and precious stones were everywhere around you, just waiting to be revealed, changing not just your life, but those of everyone you know? Today, we're venturing to South Wales Rosilli Bay, a place known for its heart-stopping beauty, but also known for its stories of shipwrecked treasure, where gold still lurks underneath its shifting sands. And while there, I'm going to reveal to you treasure of a different sort. A treasure that once realized will change your world forever. Grab your shovel. We're in search of lost treasure on the journey. It's a place out of a dream. Breathtaking landscapes, incredible sunsets, tragic shipwrecks, and buried treasure. This is Rosilli Bay, home to epic coastline and enough myth and legend to make your head spin. Known as one of the most beautiful beaches in the world, Rosilli Bay is three miles of golden sands, flanked with 250 foot high cliffs, 633 foot high hills, smugglers caves and catacombs, and crystal blue waters as far as the eye can see. Listed as the UK's first area of outstanding beauty, words do not express the sheer majesty, scope, and size of Rosilli Bay. Rosilli is a crown jewel of Wales, and every year over 100,000 people visit this beach during the warmer months to bask in its beauty and isolation. Humanity has admired Rosilli Bay for thousands of years. Human remains over 33,000 years old have been discovered nearby, and these hills are dotted with stone circles, cairns, and burial chambers created before the pyramids of Egypt rose from the desert sands. Even the Celtic saint, Kenneth, the hermit of Wales, or Saint Kenneth as he's called today, made Rosilli his home. After being miraculously saved by angels as a baby, rescued from the seas, and brought ashore at Rosilli's Wormshead Island. And speaking of Wormshead Island, it owes its name to Viking invaders, who in 850 CE began making raids into South Wales and believed the island to be an actual sleeping dragon. The Viking warlord Swain is believed to be buried atop Rosilli's hills. As legend has it, 
The fierce Viking warlord established his own kingdom here, wanting to possess Rasili's beauty. And along the shoreline, Rasili also features the most photographed house in Wales, the old rectory. The current house, built in 1850, is a cherished Welsh landmark, nestled in these majestic hills surrounding the beach. Originally used by the vicars who served nearby villages, over the old rectory's life, it's also served as a farm, a barracks for soldiers manning World War II radar stations, and is now a holiday cottage available for you and your guests. You better make your booking now though, as the average wait time to book is three years. The Rasili landscape is the definition of epic in every way, but for all its enchanting beauty, power, and glorious surf, Rasili has a reputation for something else, shipwrecks and hidden treasure. Rasili's best-known shipwreck is the Helvetia, which ran aground during a horrific storm on Halloween night, 1887. Unable to be saved after the salvage ships sent to rescue her were lost as well, the Helvetia was left to rot in the sands for all time, as a reminder of Rasili's cruelty towards seafaring vessels. But there's another shipwreck that treasure hunters at Rasili crave, that of the legendary dollar ship and her rumored multi-million pound treasure still buried underneath these sands. Some say the dollar ship was a Spanish vessel that was trapped in Rasili's rapidly shifting sands in the 17th century. Others believe it was a lost vessel that carried the dowry of a Portuguese princess. And some believe it was a Spanish ship laden with gold from the Americas. While the exact source of the dollar ship has been lost to time, what is known is that the dollar ship did indeed carry a large amount of treasure. In 1807, Rasili underwent extreme low tides, which revealed a wrecked European galleon and loads of gold. Spanish coins dated between 1625 and 1639 were found all over the beach, lying everywhere upon the sands. On one day alone, as the tide moved even further out, over six kilograms of Spanish dollars, half dollars, and pieces of eight washed up on the shoreline. And when the stories of Spanish gold hit the papers, People flooded the Gower, fueled with dreams of treasure. But Mother Nature did not stay in a giving mood. In a blink, the tide shifted, and no one could get far enough out to search underneath the waves, hiding the ship and its treasure once more beneath Rasili's waters. But this wouldn't be the dollar ship's last appearance. In 1833, another season of extreme low tides struck, revealing the ship's location again. And with that, another gold rush began, with seekers discovering gold coins, bullets, pewter, silver, cannons, even an astrolabe in the sands. But just as soon as it reappeared, the tides shifted again, hiding the dollar ship's remains beneath the waves. The dollar ship's gold still lies in Rasili's shallow waters, waiting for the next extreme low tide, for while the wreckage of the ship may be lost to time, its gold still remains. But knowing the location of her treasure is only half the battle. Because it's not enough to know where to search for Vasily's gold, you have to know when to look. And speaking of when, if you're interested in the dollar ship's treasure, your next chance at discovering her gold coins may be on the 4th of March, 2023, or the 2nd of September, 2023. As over the next two years, it's estimated the tide lines will retreat to levels not seen for almost 200 years. But will the tide be far enough out and the weather suitable to reveal the hidden treasures of Rasili? That I leave to you. Who doesn't love stories of lost treasure? I mean, even Jesus knew the power of such tales. Ever the master storyteller, Jesus used stories of seeking treasure to explain what the kingdom of God and the Father's love were like, where the characters involved took an active role in searching out items of worth, items that were lost but then found, and often purchased with great price. In your journey, I'm sure you've come to realize that intimately knowing Jesus is a treasure in itself. The journey is an invitation to know the heart. You're invited into union where our God says, I delight in you as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. And in reply, you have the honor to say, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. It's amazing what falling in love does, doesn't it? It's a complete reality shift. But here's something else. When you're in love, 
and you read his scriptures, your eyes and your ears will sometimes reveal Jesus' words a bit differently than you may have been taught. Intimacy gives a deeper meaning to Jesus' sayings. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. When you know him, everything changes, and even stories of gold and treasure take on a richer meaning. When Jesus used parables to speak of treasure in the search for hidden things, it was often mentioned as a metaphor for his kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Most people are taught parables like this one are about discovering God's kingdom and giving up everything one has to possess it. And this isn't wrong. This is absolutely correct. When we search for his kingdom and find it, we want nothing more. But here's the thing. Most teachings stop there. Why? Because we aren't seeing and listening with wide open eyes and ears of love. And we don't understand who we are in his sight. Let's go a little deeper and get to the root of something nasty most of us believe. Most of us have a greater fear of judgment than we do an understanding of love. We're taught that our sins build a wall between us and Christ and that through our striving, we can hopefully enter his kingdom when we die. Maybe, if we're lucky, and we catch God on a day that he's in a good mood. And if God thinks that way about us, that means he thinks that way about everyone else too, which actually devalues all of creation. But does that sound like good news to you? That doesn't sound like the gospel that set the early church's world on fire, does it? The truth is, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Jesus didn't walk the world in the flesh to change God's mind about the world. God loves His creation. Jesus came to change the world's mind about God and reveal His glory and love through Himself. And when we discover our treasured value in God's sight, all of a sudden, we can be sitting in prison in chains, but still enjoying the Lord's presence, knowing who we are in His heart. Jesus didn't die and rise again for trash. Jesus didn't come to release healing, hope, and love to create clay vases and worker bees. Jesus came and is coming for His bride, who He loves and adores. And that, my friend, is some real treasure. And in that treasure is purpose. When you grasp this intimate truth, you realize the deeper meaning of the parable. You realize that Jesus isn't only talking about the treasure as being a far off kingdom. You realize that to the bridegroom, it is his bride that is the treasure. God's children are his treasure, and it is he who offered everything to take possession of that treasure. You are the gold, but not only you, but everyone else in the world that he loves. We aren't just part of a kingdom we reach when we die. We are a part of the kingdom of heaven now. And when you know this, when you receive this, when it sits in your heart, all of a sudden you want everyone else to know their true value as well. You can't help it. Love himself compels you. You begin to see treasure all around you. But it's not just about finding treasure. It's about how we reveal it. You know, it doesn't take a person of God to point out the trash in someone or what they do wrong. The world does that every day. And it's super easy to make judgments based on someone's mistakes. And we all do it. Remember today's introduction? Those simple math formulas on the screen with the obvious mistake. 
of course five plus five doesn't equal 13. And no doubt you gotta laugh at my expense, or it may have driven you crazy with you wanting to correct my obviously incorrect answer. But when you saw my error, you couldn't help but focus on the one simple answer I got wrong and point to it. You may have made a judgment call on me. I've sloppy arithmetic, inattentive to detail, or I'm just plain old dumb. But what about the formulas that were correct? And what about the other formula behind me? The computations for creation, thus giving the reasoning for God. But no, you focused on what I got wrong instead of what I got right. You zeroed in on where you believed I fell short, and you might have even thought yourself superior because you caught such an easy error. And in so doing, you totally missed the next level stuff going on next to it. And while this was a simple arithmetic mistake intentionally made to make a point, it's a great example of what the religious mindset causes us to do. The religious spirit causes us to make judgments where we think people fall short and make mistakes and to elevate ourselves because of it. It causes us to devalue others based on their perceived errors and shortcomings. But here's the thing, short of Jesus, we never measure up. But that doesn't make us less valuable to Him and it never diminishes your worth. And when we partner with Jesus to call out the treasure in others, it's not to point out where they're wrong, but to reveal the gold and purpose that Jesus put inside of them before time began. Yes, there's a time and a place for correction. Mistakes do need to be brought into the light. After all, as James says, we're to confess our sins to one another. But correction from a place of perceived superiority, when there's no real relationship, will always come across as an attack, no matter our intent. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts the world of its errors, not me and not you. And we never get to judge someone because they sin differently than we do. Many modern believers are way too comfortable with using fear, shame, superiority, and anger as motivators to try to force or guilt someone into the kingdom of God. In essence, we try to use a negative force to establish a positive reaction. But that doesn't reveal treasure. It only plants bad seed. And rotten seed only produces rotten fruit. This is what Jesus meant when he said, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cross land and sea to make one convert and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell you yourselves are. But love never fails. And when we know the truth that he is the treasure and that we are the treasure, we are compelled to find the gold in others. All of a sudden, we're not seeing people through their mistakes, but through their worth. We're not bringing correction from a place of superiority, but of humility. We are called to be witnesses to Christ's glory through our love, not our judgment. This is how true radical change happens in people's lives. And this is how real salvation comes. And this is the kingdom of heaven breaking through into a person's life now, this is the discovery of the treasure of the kingdom. Do you mind if I tell you a personal story of finding treasure in the wildest place you can imagine? Years ago, I was in a Caribbean country on a short-term trip in a country where witchcraft is a huge deal. And the village I spent most of my time in was in the shadow of a large mountain. And at the top lived a powerful family, Santerian priests that had reigned over the mountain for generations through their ancestral magic. For decades, visiting Christian missionaries made a practice of venturing up that mountain looking for a fight. They'd march their groups to the witch's property line and the Christians would rebuke them, call down God's fire, Jericho march around their land, try to cast devils out, you know, all the stuff. In return, the family of witches would hurl curses back, do rituals, cast spells, all their stuff. Anger, suspicion, and fear resulted all around. So when my host told me the stories and asked if I wanted to journey up the mountain to pray for the witches, I jumped at the chance. 
So I soon began to pray to Papa for breakthrough with his family, for them to know his love, for their hearts to be softened, and for them to respond. I asked the Lord for access to their hearts, you know, so they could be saved and know his glory. But then the bridegroom said something that utterly wrecked me. I heard Jesus explicitly say, Ken, I will not give you access to their hearts, not until you're willing to love them as I do. And I was shattered with realization. You see, my prayers, which I thought were good, reeked of manipulation. When I held my prayers up to the love of Jesus, I found that I was loving this family from an agenda, trying to save them. A noble thing, yes, but I was praying for them as if they were a target, something to be conquered. Basically, I was resorting to a form of witchcraft to try and prove the glory of the Lord and save the witches. And I had left true love out of it. The Lord reminded me of the parable of the woman and her lost coin. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. He showed me that although the coin was lost, the coin still belonged to its owner, and the coin never lost its original value. And just like that, everything changed for me. I didn't have to go confront these witches to challenge them or rebuke them. I didn't need to call down fire. I needed to remember what spirit I was of, that of a Savior's love. You see, that family, they weren't a box to be checked. They weren't a variable in an evangelism growth chart, and they weren't a number in a quarterly report. In the Father's eyes, that family was a treasure. He already knew them. He already loved them. He already knew where they were in their hearts. I just had to show up and be his ambassador. When we finally met the priestess, we found that she looked like an ordinary lady, like someone you pass on the street every day. And after the introductions, I asked if I could give her a hug, and she obliged. And wrapping my arms around her, I felt the love of Jesus just surge out of every pore of my body, flooding into the door of her home, quieting the darkness and anger and fear. I felt like I was hugging a long lost friend and we had known each other forever. And tears burst from my eyes and when we finally broke our embrace, tears ran down her cheeks as well. I mean, it was one of the best hugs of my life and all I can say is that it was Jesus. The priestess enthusiastically invited us in and introduced me to her husband, the Babalawo of the mountain. And for the next five hours, we sat in the simple home of this family that everyone had been so terrified of, surrounded by tools of ritual magic, skulls, and animal bones. We drank tea while watching the sunset over the mountainside, talking about life and love and Jesus. When I looked at them, I didn't see a dark priest and priestess to be beaten in a spiritual battle. I didn't care about the rumors of curses. All I could see was the golden treasure that this family was in his eyes. I simply saw a family that God loved so much that he sent his only son. And that was years ago. And now, that family that everyone was so terrified of are radical lovers of Jesus. And they spread his love to any who will receive it. They find gold in the unlikeliest of places. They call out the truth of who people are in God's sight. They're local missionaries spreading the truth of God's love throughout the mountains of their ancestral home and are now even in charge of children's ministries in multiple churches. They go and pray for those who were once like them, the witches that the Christians tried to pick fights with. And through love, they're changing the face of a nation, finding lost coins wherever they go. Love, after all, it never fails. Your purpose is to be loved and to be a witness to Christ's glory through that love, to know you're a treasure and to reveal treasure in others because treasure hunters create treasure hunters. 
We are called to enter into relationship with one another, to love one another, to disciple others and bring them into this intimate dance with the one who loved us first. This is how true change happens in people's lives. That is salvation. And when you're in love, everyone knows. And those in love help show others how to fall in love. We don't draw people closer by telling them where they're wrong and by discrediting their closely held beliefs. It's not about supernatural showdowns and picking fights. It's about shining so bright with His love that His majesty cannot be denied, of shining so spectacularly that those who see it can't help but ask, how do I know the source of your love? That is how you become the light that everyone flocks to. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. It's about the love of Christ shining through you, disarming the powers and authorities through the love of the cross and resurrection. It's about revealing the gold, gold that God put there for others to find. You're a treasure hunter, you see. It's what you do by being who you are, passionately loved by your Creator. I mean, look around. Gold's all around you. It's time to reveal it. And I'll see you down the road on the journey. It's a word both spoken from the pulpits of the powerful and invoked by the unknown in quiet prayer rooms. It's a word that quickens the pulse of believers across the world, met with cheers and longing. Revival. But what exactly is revival? Is it an event, a movement, or is it something else? Can revivals be planned and organized? Can you even find the word revival in the scriptures? And what does the word revival mean for those on an intimate journey with Jesus? Join me and my incredible friend, Ray Hughes, as we venture to Neath Mission Hall, one of the cradles of the Welsh Revival. A revival so powerful and so transformative that its tremors are still felt around the world over a hundred years later. A revival that's not only shaped modern Christian spiritual culture, but has impacted billions of souls across the world. Do you really want revival? Are you willing to pay the price revival demands? And what if, just what if, you are called to more. Are you ready for a revolution? It's time for you to take your next radical step upon the waves. Join me on the journey. I'm standing outside a wonder of the modern Christian world, the Mission Hall in Neath, Wales. If you aren't familiar with Neath Mission Hall, you should be. It was the spiritual home of titans of the Welsh Revival, a revival praised by many as one of the greatest the world has ever known. A revival so intense that it changed billions of lives across the globe. Wales has a well-deserved reputation in Christian circles for being the land of revival. Whether it was the bright flame of Celtic Christianity sending out missionaries throughout Europe, its fervency during its days of Catholicism and then Anglicism, and then the efficiency of the Protestant movement, there's something about the land here that holds what feels like sacred intent. Those that know her well refer to her as God's country, and I'm inclined to agree. Between 1762 and 1862, there were 15 reported revivals throughout Wales, led by powerful people of faith such as Griffith John, the boy preacher of Wales, who gave his first sermon at 14 years old, Daniel Davies, the prince of the pulpit, and Christmas Evans, the seven-foot, one-eyed preacher of Wales. But between 1862 and 1904, there were no major revivals of note in Wales. Those that had remained faithful called out for a new mighty move of God to fall upon the land. But other than a few small tremors, 
Nothing had spread across the region in mass. But that didn't stop the hunger of those that craved God's glory to awaken the people of Wales. Included amongst those were Frank and Seth Joshua, two brothers who earned a strong following throughout rough and tough South Wales in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And I love that Ray is just full of stories about their wonderful work here in Neath and beyond. Seth Joshua's brother, Frank, and Seth were really the two sons of thunder that carried the fire to Neath, Wales, 20 years before uh, the Welsh Revival. They, they couldn't have been more different, yet they couldn't have been more the same. Seth was bold and boisterous and loud, and when he walked into the room, the lights would come on or the lights would have to, uh, to, to give room for his presence, if you will. He was bigger than life and he was always full of intrigue and, uh, and personality. And Frank was the one who carried the peace of God and the beauty of God, the wonder of God, the quietness, if you will. He said that he, he uh, built the church, but he actually pastored the whole town. A couple of interesting facts to show you the uniqueness of what was going on at the time when Seth and Frank, especially Frank, being stationed here. He was, he was uh, stationed here for those 40 years as pastor. When they built this church, remember, this is before the high tide of what became known as the Welsh Revival came in 1904. But he was, he was here for years before that. But this church was full. And people were being saved every week. People were being saved in the streets. So revival came here before the revival, if you will. And that's one of the reasons that, that it's built in the way that it was. In those times, in those days, they were building, you know, beautiful marble churches and glorious sanctuaries of man's greatness and in God's honor. But they didn't build it like that here in Wales. As a matter of fact, they didn't even have the pews, anything like that. They didn't put pews in the church. And the reason they did that was, is because this is a place for soul winning, and this is a place for music, and this is a place for activity and creativity and life. The whole thing was designed around being a music hall. And the pews were left out so that, because these chairs, they would go out and do street ministry with these chairs. So can you, you might imagine that you could sit here in these chairs on a Sunday morning. Now you're looking at these new, new blue ones here in the shot, but all of those over there are the old Welsh oak chairs that in those days on Friday and Saturdays when they're doing meetings on the street or some meetings up, up, uh, up the valley somewhere, they would load wagon loads of these old Welsh oak chairs and take these to the tent meetings. And then they would bring them back and put them in. It wasn't about creating sterilized atmospheres of sanctity. It was about practical things. Like, how are we going to reach the community? How is our song going to be heard in the streets? How is the preaching of the Word of God going to go out there where there's more people out there than there are in here? Those are the kind of innovative ideas that Frank and Seth were moving in long before the Welsh Revival ever even took place. And this old building still stands here as the grandest hall in, uh, in Neath until, from that day until this. What they brought wasn't contained here in this building. It spread out across this place and soon became an earthquake whose tremors would reverberate outside of this small town and into the surrounding valleys. But this was only the beginning of what was in store for early 20th century Wales. As Seth and Frank fervently prayed for revival night and day for over 20 years, the volcanic pastor, Joseph Jenkins, was preparing the way for a major awakening as well. In February 1904, while Jenkins preached in Newquay, West Wales, a 20-year-old girl named Flory Evans stood to her feet and simply declared, And the rest, as they say, is history. These beautiful, faith-filled words of a young girl from a seaside village became the catalyst for the wildfire to come. But as Ray will point out, it wasn't only Flory's passion that poured out over Wells. Uh, in this obscure place that I'm standing in, Neath Wales, is the grave of a man who, if you really want to think about it, would be one of the most important figures in revival history. And uh, his name is Seth Joshua. 
And he's the man who carried the torch. He carried the flame here in Wales of, of faith and prophecy and, and declaration for 20 years. He would pray openly and publicly. He would pray a prayer. Oh God, one day raise up someone that will carry the torch for revival in, in Wales again. He would pray and prophesy that one day God will raise up some young man uh, out of the fields or out of the mines here. Don't send us some big star from America or some uh, celebrity from London or in England somewhere. Uh, he believed that the, the simplicity of this land carried a, a how, sh how should we say, a residue, uh, a knowing, a remnant was always in, the, always in the air here that God was gonna do something powerful again in Wales. And there had been no revivals in quite some time. He was praying in that little chapel that morning when Evan Roberts was present and Seth Joshua is the one who prayed the simple prayer, oh God, bend the church and save the world, which sounded like had a little preacherism on it, but no, there was no pretense with this man. He was, he was one of the last of the real poet preachers that without pretense. And when he prayed that prayer, he meant it because he had been carrying that prayer for almost a generation. And when he said, oh God, bend the church and save the world, that's when Evan Roberts heard in his heart, oh God, bend me and save Wales. And in that moment, you might say nitro met glycerin, if you will. And there was a combination that was found in agreement in that moment. And one man spoke and one man's life was changed. And as a result, a whole nation changed. Imagine a whole nation changed. After this fated meeting with Seth Joshua, Evan Roberts claimed intense dreams and visions with the Lord. He attended meeting after meeting across Wales, urging the youth present to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And on October 31st, 1904, Roberts felt the Holy Spirit move upon him again. But instead of collapsing into convulsions, Evan calmly told the group of youth of the goodness of God. His simple words holding those present in thrall. And then Evan Roberts quietly voiced aloud, if those present believed, the Lord would give us 100,000 souls. And with those words, the Welsh revival caught fire. If the ground had been prepared with the oil of prayers and worship of those that had come before, then Evan Roberts was the match the Lord used to set wells aflame. But here's the interesting bit. Roberts was not known for his brilliance in speaking, his insightful teaching, or cutting-edge revelation. In fact, Evan Roberts would have been the first to say the revival didn't have anything to do with him. This he made very clear, giving away every penny that was given to him, refusing adulation, and even refraining from preaching if he felt people were coming to events just to hear him speak. And while he may have provided a spark that helped light the revival, the revival was not about him. The focus was to be on God and God alone. The most amazing thing about the Welsh revival was its focus on worship, which manifested in supernatural outpourings of the Spirit. While past revivals and reformations throughout history had an emphasis on preaching, the Welsh revival was a torrent of singing and joy. Just as when Frank Joshua stood on his crate outside Neath train station years before and burst into song, the Welsh revival was driven by the song of its people. There was no opening of the meeting. The hearts were full and burst with prayer and praise to a God felt to be in our midst. Everyone was absorbed with God, but in the midst of it, no one dealing with them. A man here, a woman there, would yield to God and in a few minutes stand up and give praise that they had found the Lord. Sometimes singing and prayer would go on together, but there was no real confusion. The praying was not to man, and the singing was not to man. But such singing is rarely to be heard. It was perfect time and perfect harmony. Often the same hymn, never given out, but started spontaneously, sung in English and in Welsh at the same time and sung over and over until it penetrated. It never ceases to amaze me to stand here and imagine what it could have been like and would have been like 
to hear the sounds bouncing off of all of this wood and these beautiful toned surfaces. Notice when you're hearing my voice right now, it's not some big old echoey church hall with rigid structures that just bounces and resonates tones and notes into an oblivion. No, even this room has the ability to become an instrument of praise. I'm standing here speaking out across there. There was no PA systems in the day, but they, oh, amplified, they oh, magnified the Lord with me. And this place would have been wall to wall, packed all the way to the top of people, joining in song with Seth and Frank and Bob Jones, the choir leader. Sometimes I wish we could just go back just long enough to hear the song. But I guess instead, we're going to have to hear the song and be the ones that sing it today in all of the places that we can carry the beauty of what God did with them. God wants to do the same with us today. He just wants to release everything in here into all of the world as a praise unto God from the earth. There are just so many stories about this place and I thank God for Ray. He's such a carrier of them. Imagine people just walking outside the gatherings, being overcome in the spirit, dropping to their knees and asking to know the Lord. Bars and pubs emptied out, jails standing empty with crime literally dropping to zero rates. Women that were known prostitutes stood in the meeting halls, crying out to God and leading prayers. Hard drinkers emptied their liquor bottles, instantly sobered and sang of the Lord's goodness. Miracles were common and services would run for hours into the late evening and early mornings. Within weeks, 30,000 had committed their lives to Christ. And over the span of the next nine months, Evan's dream of over 100,000 souls in Wales came to fruition. But as you can imagine, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. Not everyone was happy with the revival, particularly those in mainline churches and denominations. The emphasis on spontaneous worship and prayer with little to no organization or hierarchy was frightening for those who believed in the iron-bound ways of church dogma. And one of the most common claims against those involved in the Welsh Revival were that the healings and prophecies uttered by those in the crowds were demonically inspired rather than heaven sent, since they weren't happening in the more traditional settings. And rumors abounded of mass delusions, hysterics, and mesmerism, not to mention the attempts to assassinate the character of Evan Roberts. While the criticisms and assaults became more frequent, what no one could deny was that something never before seen was happening in Wales. Yet, by mid-1906, the Welsh Revival did begin to slow. The pressure cooker of constant travel and the press caused Roberts to retire from public ministry. By the end of the year, he devoted himself to a life of private prayer, only rarely appearing in public over the rest of his life. And with the disappearance of Roberts, the Welsh Revival fires dimmed. But the story was far from over. Visitors to the meeting halls of the 0405 Welsh Revival traveled to Los Angeles, California, inspiring a man named William Seymour, who yearned to see the glory of the Lord. On April 9th, 1906, revival fire smashed into his Azusa Street meetings, just as it had in Wales, inspiring a revival that would continue for nine years, becoming the catalyst for the modern Pentecostal and charismatic movements in the United States. And eight months after the Azusa meetings began on December 31st, 1906, the same revival fire fell in Dunn, North Carolina, during meetings led by a man named G.B. Cashwell. And just like Azusa Street, as in Wales, the focus was on worship of the Lord and of being expectant of His presence. Thousands traveled from across the Deep South to tiny Dunn, North Carolina, to experience the Lord in ways they had never before witnessed supernatural outpourings, healings, true salvations, and a deeper understanding of a Savior's love. Back in the United Kingdom, the effects of the revival flowed from Wales and into the rest of the British Isles, particularly fueling the Apostolic and Elam Church movements, leading over one million to Christ before the First World War. And over the next few decades, the Welsh Revival would be credited as the source of revivals within India, Korea, and China, and then Japan and Southern Africa. 
and then rolling in wave after wave of revivals and awakenings over the whole of Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America. And these waves are still rippling today. Chances are, the Welsh revival is a reason you're watching this video right now. The Welsh Revival wasn't just an isolated incident in a beautiful, wild, and rugged country. The Welsh Revival changed the face of worship for modern churches and encouraged church-going people to experience the presence of God firsthand. It changed everything. But some would argue that the Welsh Revival ended as fast as it appeared, and eventually life in Wales returned to business as usual. So what happened? And more than that, have we turned revival into an idol. And what exactly is revival in the first place? Is the word revival even mentioned in scripture and did Jesus say we were supposed to pray for it? The answer may surprise and even offend you. It may shock you, but there is absolutely no mention of the word revival in the Bible. Jesus never used the word, neither did the apostles. Yes, there are 11 verses in the Old Testament that mention reviving, but in the way that we have been taught about revival, the word doesn't exist in the scriptures. If you were to ask a Hebraic Jew where you could find the word revival in the Tanakh, they would have absolutely no idea what you were talking about. And that's because revival is not a biblical term. It's a church term. It's a part of our special language, Christianese, if you will. And the word didn't even come into use until the 18th century. Now, just because revival isn't mentioned in the Bible, it doesn't mean it's not real. I believe wholeheartedly in revival. Revival is much of a real thing as other church history terms, such as Reformation, Catholicism, denominationalism, and a whole bunch of other isms. Revival is very real and it is wonderful. But revival was never something we were told to specifically pray for by Jesus or any other author in the New Testament. It's not something we specifically were told to plan or organize or judge good results by. And more importantly, revival is not something we are supposed to pray towards as if it's the ultimate end-all be-all. Because the truth is, it isn't. Revival is not the ultimate final boss level of faith awesomeness. And revival is for sure, absolutely, unequivocally, not something that we're supposed to idolize and put up on a pedestal, which is what we tend to do. And it's where we go off course. Point blank, I'm not called to yearn for revival. I'm called to yearn for Jesus. True revival is a byproduct of those pursuing an intimate journey with their creator, which is exactly what happened during the Welsh and the Zusa Street revivals. It's individuals such as Frank and Seth Joshua being so filled with the presence of God, they were driven to sing outside the pubs and brothels of Neath in the face of disdain. It's Joseph Jenkins asking, what does the Lord Jesus Christ mean to you? And Flory Evans being filled with the Spirit and the one brave enough to stand and say, I love the Lord Jesus Christ with all of my heart, sending shockwaves throughout the crowd and driving them to their knees with conviction. It was Seth Joshua calling out for the one to rise from the pits, one with such passion and intimacy with Jesus, whose example could revive the hearts of the nation of Wales to God. It was a young, quiet man who loved Jesus so much, who dwelt so much with God in the secret place that he himself became a thin place for the love of Jesus, who uttered the words, bend me, O Lord, bend me, and showed in nation what complete and utter devotion to the Holy Spirit look like. Real revival is your dry bones coming alive in intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Real revival is the destruction of your false identity and you waking up to who you really are, a child of God. Real revival is knowing who your Father is, a loving Creator who designed you to create with Him and who would stop at nothing to destroy every barrier between you and Him. Real revival is you realizing who Jesus is the bridegroom who intimately desires his bride for you to know him as he knows you. Real revival is you becoming a thin place 
where multiple dimensions collide, making you an atmosphere changer, a releaser of His presence and glory so that His love and passion flows out of you like a river of living water. Real revival comes from you dwelling in this secret place, entering into the bridal chamber and becoming united with God. Real revival is becoming so overwhelmed with His love that you realize that He is the treasure and you are the treasure as well as everyone who He loves. And real revival is entering into the wonder that He is and reveling in the expectation of the Holy Spirit's freeing power in every area of life. Real revival comes to regions when His children stand collectively and say, Lord, we'll do whatever it takes to reveal Your glory to those who will receive it. And mass revival is the result of singular men and women, just like you, fully powered by intimacy with Jesus, filled with that yearning and intimacy catching fire and spreading throughout all who witness it. Because He is God and He is worthy. When we call out for revival more than yearning for intimacy, we're missing something important. Revival can be asked for and it can be proclaimed, but outside of intimacy with Jesus, it's nothing. It's just another meeting or a conference designed to sell tickets and books. And sure, good things may come out of it, but in the end, it's mostly hay and stubble. And outside of intimacy with God, revival cannot be sustained because God's version of revival is so much more than what we understand. History shows us that once people with true intimacy with the Lord release real revival, once the miracles begin and the fires start flowing, some predictable things happen. First, we try to make a plan. Then we try to organize and quantify our results. And then we try to build a system around the revival to continue seeing results. In other words, we attempt to institute control. And soon we begin to rely on the manipulation of emotional responses to gauge our success. How many people raise their hands instead of how many people actually enter into relationship and change their lives. But here's the thing. If it's not intimacy, it's not true transformation. It's not a renewal of the heart and mind. It's not real salvation. Because once the revival becomes about anything more than a byproduct of intimacy with the King, it begins at Swift Inn. Because revival is not supposed to be the end result. It's supposed to be a new beginning. Maybe it's time we change our understanding of revival. Our understanding of revival is focused on resuscitating the old. Revival comes from the word revive, as in revive something that has fallen ill or lifeless. So that means revival, as it's often reflected in the church, is actually about resuscitating old wineskins. But when God revives us, He calls us into a new reality. When He shakes off dry bones, He's not wanting to go back to the way things used to be. It's not a patch repair job. We're born again. When we enter into a truly intimate relationship with Him, He calls us a kainos creation. When we enter into an intimate relationship with God, we are turned into a completely new being. In beginning your journey, you right now are undergoing revival. God's version of revival is calling us back to His original design, the identity He gave you before the beginning of time. It's intended to lead us into something we've never seen before. And most importantly, once seen, we cannot ever go back to life as usual. Think of the disciples. They couldn't go back to normal life after witnessing Jesus post-resurrection. John 21 shows us that professional fishermen couldn't even catch fish anymore, for the Lord had called them to be fishers of men. These individual men who intimately knew Jesus could never go back to life as it was, and they answered the call, bringing the gospel to the corners of the known world. There was no going back, and life could never be the same again. Do you really want God's version of revival? Yeah, it sounds wonderful that during the Welsh Revival, the jails and the courts were empty, the bars and pubs were bare, and that the churches were full all hours of the day with people quitting their jobs to attend wild worship services. 
But one of the little reported facts of the Welsh Revival is that it crashed local economies. Restaurants, pubs, government offices, theaters, and police officers had no revenue. Society was literally upended. If revival actually struck, would you leave your job? Would you follow the passion of the Lord wherever and whenever it took you? Are you willing to leave it all behind? Are you willing to sacrifice everything for Him, just like Frank did, just like Seth did, just like Evan did, just as Jesus did when He sacrificed everything for you? Is intimacy with God still worth it? Are you the one who's truly willing to bend? What if the next major move of God didn't come from the platform, the stage, or from those behind camera, but instead came from the least among us, from the broken, the meek, the used, those who had seen the face of the King and were so consumed with His love that it infected everyone around them and made them say, bend me, O Lord, bend me. Because God's version of revival is so much more than anything that has come before. When God's version of revival comes, life as usual is over. Because while we clamor for revival, what God is actually calling us to is revolution. Funny thing about revival. We pray for it. We call out for it. We ask God to bring it. But revival isn't God's responsibility to release. It's ours. The truth is, God is waiting for us. He's already given us revival, His Son. And God's glory fills the earth. It's never left. It's still there in the deep wells, waiting for the ones to mine it out. It's in the waters, waiting for the ones to pull it from the deep. Your Father is waiting for you to step into revolution. Your Father is waiting for you to rise up and release His love wherever you go to pull from your creative heart His revolution of glory. He's waiting for His children to accept the responsibility and release a revolution of love wherever they tread. All creation is eagerly awaiting the revealing of the sons and daughters, those willing to stop at nothing to reveal the love of the Father. He's waiting for the ones to step into their destiny, stand and say, I will do whatever it takes. I love the Lord Jesus Christ with all my heart bend me. And I'm telling you this, and I've walked with you this far on the journey to tell you that I think that person is you. The journey isn't a supplementary plan to improve your life. When you start walking with the God of the universe, things can never be the same. It is a revolutionary change in heart and mind. It's a revolutionary change of life as we know it from top to bottom. And like David, like the disciples, like the apostles, like the titans of the Welsh revival, there is no going back. When God's revolution hits you, when you awaken to your reality as a kainos creation, a new species, a son or daughter of the Most High God, life as you knew it ends. Your identity comes from who God says you are, regardless of your job, your gender, your race, or whatever has been used to define you. You're a child not a slave. Your former heart of stone, hardened by the world, has been ripped from you and you've been given a new heart, bound in the bridal chamber to Jesus Himself. You're included in the dance that has existed since time began. As the triune God entered into a dance, creation from a spinning motion, we exist in the center of the dance. And He has called us forth and placed us into the dance with Him. The Lord of the dance is called you, not to simply meander through your life, but to dance with Him in a blaze of glory, transforming the world around you. You are a new creation. This is your journey, and it is one that only you can take. The world is not the same as it was a hundred years ago. <laughs> the world isn't the same as it was three years ago. And God isn't calling you to the revival of a past time, but a revolution in new time. You were made for such a time as this, and you were born into this time for a reason. You are the reason we put the journey together for you to realize who you really are. Do you feel it? Do you feel it bubbling beneath your outstretched fingers? Do you feel the shift underneath your feet? 
Do you feel the tide pulling you further out? The past days of man's revival are about to be swarmed with God's revolution, a revolution of men and women filled with His radical love, who put down their old ways and adopt the way of not only Jesus' cross, but His throne. And it's happening now. You are designed to rule and reign with Him, to co-labor and reveal your Father's glory upon the earth, to bring His life to everyone you know, to bring the awareness of the glory of the Lord to the earth as the waters fill the sea. You're a world changer. You're your father's child. You're a revolutionary. This is your destiny. And this, this revolution, this is your journey.